743, we're going to call the open session to order. I'm joined by members, mm -hmm. Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mrs. Gonzalez, and Mr. Studo. And we're going to begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you everybody for your <laughs> patience um, as we work through some matters in executive session. We're a little later than we began. We wanted to begin, but we're here. The first order of business that we're, we're gonna address are our board member reports. Mr. O'Leary, you can start us off. Okay, a couple of um, okay, kind of sad and happy notes at the same time. We had uh, a couple of individuals who are a true unsung heroes within the community who passed away this week. Um, again, who've had significant impact in, in different ways, but uh, significant nonetheless. So one is uh, Deacon Al Balistracci, and, and many of you may have, uh, have known him, because I've known him for 50 plus years. I, I went to school with a couple of his kids, and uh, he's been a long time member of the community. Um, but uh, Deacon Al, you know, he was a, uh, a Navy veteran of uh, the Korean War. <coughs> Uh, he was a, uh, a registered nurse um, and had a master's degree and, and worked for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, for, for many years. He, he actually uh, opened a facility in North Reading for special needs students uh, ages 18 to 20 and some years later worked to uh, start a, a facility uh, in North Reading, a program to trying to re rehabilitate uh, first time offenders out of the Boston Juvenile Court. And then he uh, he became an on-site administrator at the Hogan Regional uh, Center and the North Reading Rehab Center, which was the old J.T. Berry Center. When he first moved his family here, he was actually on the campus of the J.T. Berry Center and then uh, situated himself and his family um, just around the corner on, on Pine Street. Uh, he's been there for you know, probably 50 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was 28 years um, working for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and then uh, you know, so he had a vocation, obviously a vocation is a registered nurse uh, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts concerned with um, mental health uh, issues, um, did a fa fabulous job, but also had another calling and uh, he retired early from the state and answered that calling and became a deacon, um, was a deacon of St. Teresa's Church for 40 years. So um, interesting enough, he, uh, he was past grand night at the, uh, for the Knights of Columbus, he was a member of the Christian Community Service uh, Center, uh, he played you know, softball here in North Reading for years up until age 50 and then became an avid golfer, particularly at Hillview Country Club. And I think the only time I ever heard Deacon Al swear was uh, after one of his uh, golf outings at, at Hillview, uh, where he uh, wasn't cursing the course or the conditions of the course or the weather or his clubs, but basically his own ability uh, to uh, master a sport that many of us will never uh, be able to, <laughs> to master. But uh, Deacon Al was... Uh, father of um, five children that he raised here in North Reading, went to North Reading Public Schools, um, nine grandchildren, 12 great-grandchildren, and eight great-great-grandchildren. So he and his wife Marge, who passed away a couple of years ago, obviously had a uh, very fulfilling uh, uh, life here in North Reading and uh, contributed to the community. I mean, he contributed to the uh, spiritual, emotional, and uh, uh, well-being of this community for, again, uh, close to 50 years. So again, we, we mourn his passing, but for someone who lived into his 90th year here, he's just short of his 90th birthday, um, you know, he, he jokingly told people, according to his obituary, that he was a failure because as a child he wanted to be a priest or a doctor, and he only ended up being a nurse or a deacon. Uh, but again, he had a successful and uh, full life, and again, we're grateful for his, uh, his contributions and grateful for his staying here in the community and uh, to Victor, Mark, Sherry, Kathy, and Lisa, where we offer our, our condolences and our appreciation for his service. The other member of the community, a uh, long member of the community who uh, passed away was, uh, was John Freiburg. And for any of you who had uh, high school athletes uh, in the school system over the last 15 years, um, you probably would recognize him, uh, would have known him. Uh, would have appreciated what he did for you. And uh, uh, John, <clears throat> again, he, again, he had a vocation, you know, in the financial services industry for a number of years, but had a passion for, uh, for photography. And what he did and what he contributed to this community and for the 
the, the families and children of this community, particularly the uh, student athletes, uh, was phenomenal and, and unmatched. Uh, John was forever at uh, sporting events, not just home events. He went away to, to the away games. He went to the football games, he went to the soccer games, he went to the field hockey games, he went to the girls and boys basketball games, he went to the soccer matches all throughout the Cape Ann League and through all the tournaments throughout the Commonwealth, taking pictures and photographs and videos of student athletes and giving them, gifting them to, um, to the families and to, to the kids. And many of the kids using these uh, photographs and um, memorabilia to, again, get scholarships uh, to higher education institutions based on their athletic ability, uh, but more importantly, gave them lifetime memories uh, uh, to, to show to their children and grandchildren uh, if in years to come. Uh, touched so many families. Just a wonderful, warm individual um, who was recognized a couple of years ago uh, and uh, inducted recently last year into the North Reading uh, Sports Hall of Fame. There was first commitment to community service and having dedicated over 15 years to photog uh, photographing Hornet student athletes. Uh, and again, if you go through the high school, you've been through the high school, and you see the photographs up on the wall, in the Hall of Fame photographs. Uh, many of those John took and donated. It never took a dime. Uh, well, so many people just want to say, "Let me pay you for the film. Let me pay you for the, you know, the printing costs." It, it, it wouldn't take a dime. Uh, so he was recognized, fortunately, a year or so ago, along with his daughter, daughter Allie, who was also inducted into Hall of Fame because of her uh, athletic ability and prowess. Uh, so again, it was quite an honor for him and his daughter to be inducted the same year, which was wonderful. But he lost a long battle with, uh, with the form of cancer. Uh, he's been fighting for almost a decade. And, uh, you know, so to Chris and Allie and uh, his son, Jay, you know, our heartfelt condolences and appreciation for, uh, for his services. So uh, just wanted to acknowledge, again, these, the passing of these two individuals. Uh, again, unsung heroes, never elected officials, um, a strong thread in the fabric of this community, and um, they're going to be missed, and they're uh, certainly have been greatly appreciated. So, uh, just wanted to acknowledge. Uh, that <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, uh, you have well, a lot on. You have a lot on the agenda tonight. <laughs> I have a few. Your work as a liaison. Yeah. Um, so to begin, um, I did my second session of the uh, Racial Justice Summit, um, and uh, we had, um, again, some of the youth came out for this, some individual volunteers, um, uh, Hornets Against Hate, uh, they, they tend to the sessions, and we, we, we had a really good discussion. I think it's showing up on, um, it's, you, you're seeing it now if you follow the Community Connection, the discussions are the people that are participating and the people that came to the summit, it's a very positive thing that people are doing. Um, so um, anyways, I thought it was successful. I'm done with my part of it. And I, I challenged them all with some potential future assignments, potentially an implicit challenge for the implicit bias challenge for the town to take on and learn more about what we don't know. So we'll see where that goes. Hopefully that'll come out in the next month or two. Um, but I wanted to thank um, these are town employees who came out, you know, on their own time because we did it at night. Jen Ford, Bob Collins came, Paul Lucci, who is our senior resource officer at the school, Amy Luckowitz and Mary Prenny all came out um, for the sessions to meet with these people and provide really good support for them to let them know that, you know, there's avenues to get your work done and, you know, we're here to support you and as much as possible. So it was a great volunteer effort. Um, the second thing is my friend uh, Phil Hertz, who is leading up our um, the trailways, the bike path effort, um, uh, included me in an email that they were just given a grant of another forty-five thousand dollars from the state uh, to continue to make uh, progress on the trail feasibility study. So he wrote me asking, um, you know, how, how we want to spend that money. So I think probably in a very future select board session, we should have him come in and explain the project and uh, we can help them figure out how to spend the $45,000. But that project started in 2017. We couldn't have a better person who's leading it than Phil Hertz. He loves biking. He's a procurement specialist. He understands how to do these things. And he's very well, very well um, versed on what the issues are for the town. He knows all the issues that are going on. So um, while we have the momentum, let's keep it going because people will be absolutely surprised to see what um, beauty we have in town that we we're not even aware of. Um, today I met with um, 
uh, Kim Manzelli, who's our chair of our um, COA and the SSAT group, and Catherine McCabe, who's a loyal volunteer, also with the CA, COA, plus um, the people from the UMass General, General Etology group, study group, and we're trying to uh, negotiate a contract um, for the community compact. And I think we had a really good session today, and I think uh, we'll be seeing a final version of that in the next few days so we can sign off and get going on that. And this is all about um, us becoming an age-friendly community and um, how can we, the bottom line is, this is where North Reading is now. These are our gaps. And this is way way AARP, who we support, is saying we should move to go forward. And that, you know, the goal is to within nine months have a report in front of everybody so we can make some real progress. And the last thing is I'm delighted my neighbors and Martin's Pond Association is here today to talk about the pond. Um, and I'll let them take it on when we get to that part of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walmer. Mr. Studo. Um. I'd actually like to applaud another group of elected officials. Uh, Dr. Daly and Chair Buckley and the entire school committee, um, I feel have come up with some very good plans for the town, for the town students uh, that were very difficult to come up. I mean, we all know of how impossible of a situation it's been just to organize a town meeting to vote on Turkey Farm. So forget about getting kids back to school. And I feel that, and I'd like to give a shout out. I was on a call as a parent earlier, uh, excuse me, last week where they unveiled the plan. And it's almost like they're making the best out of a situation that seems to be changing the rules of the game on them weekly and sometimes daily. So again, I just like to applaud, uh, you know, Dr. Daly and the entire school committee for such a great job they're doing for, uh, you know, the parents and everyone, you know, of North Reading who has a vested interest in the schools. So um, that's that's what I got. <laughs> You're on mute, Kate. You're muted. <laughs> okay, I said that. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Studo. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, I'd like to thank Steve for that wonderful um, description of Deacon Al. Um, I was going to speak about him also, but you said everything that needed to be said, other than in my personal knowing of him, he was such a wonderful man and he's a huge loss to our community. Um, and, and my condolences go out to his family also. And I'll touch on Mr. Wong with um, Mr. Hertz and, and what a fantastic job and how much time, his own time and effort he's put into that real trail and um, we thank him. And then I would uh, like to talk about an event that I am one of four organizers putting together, um, doing it as a private citizen, not a select board member. Um, we are having a support. Oh, you're, you're muted. It's the blue. Is he talking? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Mr. Gilberto, I'm gonna ask you to mute all of the attendees and participants and then unmute Mrs. Gonzalez and those of us that need to speak because there's clearly people that are joining who are not muted and disrupting the tra the transmission of information? We really need to have be you know hear Mrs. Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, and everyone else that's going to be attending. Thanks, Mr. Gilberto. Thank Can you. Go ahead, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, so I would, um, I wanted to talk about a, an event um, to support the police of North Reading on August 12th from 5.30 to 7 at the Town Common. Um, it's going to be just a show of support for our local police. Uh, we're, we're going to hold signs. We're going to light up the gazebo blue. We're going to have some patriotic music um, and just wave and, and show that we appreciate um, our local police department. Um, I'm encouraging the residents to light up blue 
Um, if you want to put a blue light on your porch or light up a tree or whatever with blue lights. Um, we also have yard signs available that are free. Um, if you go on to our Facebook page, Support the Blue, um, you can let us know that you want to sign and we will get it to you. Um, what I want to make clear, though, is that this is not a political event. We encourage everyone to come out and show support to the police, but we do not want any political signs. Leave those home. Um, you can make your own signs, but they should all just be thank yous and supports of the police. It's, it's, it's not to be political at all. So um, other than that, we welcome everybody to come out August 12th, 5.30 to 7. It's a Wednesday night and show our police department that we appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. And I'm actually going to go back to um, the individuals Mr. Studo mentioned, uh, Dr. Daly, the school committee, the um, administration, uh, Principal Lopret, the graduation, the outdoor graduation ceremony happened July 24th, and it could not have been more professionally organized and arranged, and uh, it was a very it was excellent. The program was excellent. There were um, three honor essayists and one um, class essayist that was chosen. Their speeches were remarkable. They were excellent. They were well written. They were to the point. They were current. Um, there was um, a high young Kim was the first one. Uh, Samantha Galvin, um, Mary Regan, and. Elizabeth, Lizzie, Elizabeth Barrett, and the two marshals, class marshals, two students from the class, you probably all know Bridget Grew, you probably have interacted with her multiple times if you've attended any high school events, and she's always there helping out, volunteering, doing something or other, and Joseph Holdley uh, organized it, they were the class marshals that helped to organize it, just excellent from beginning to end, it was wonderful. I know for um, Scott Buckley, the chair of the school, the two most memorable uh, speeches for me for some reason, and everybody gets impacted by different things, but were mm -hmm. Samantha Galvin's and Mr. Buckley's for me, Samantha Galvin, you know, did this amazing speech and her one key piece of advice was, you know, find your moment of clarity every every day and her moment of clarity was every every day driving up the hill to the to the high school that's where she had her moment of clarity where she just kind of reset her day and um and scott buckley was saying you know how when you sit wherever you're sitting it's your particular perspective and it's your it's accurate from your perspective but it's not going to be this perspective of the person sitting across across the field on the other side. It was just very well done and very current. And I just wanted to thank everybody that was a part of putting that together. And just like Mr. Studo said about these upcoming, the school year, that was not an easy task from assembly to dismantling, to getting everyone together. And it was a great time for the kids and it was uh, very well done. So I just want to applaud them, everybody that was involved in that, including public facilities for setting it up to helping get everything set up on the field. It was a, it was a well done. Everything was well done. All right. So we're uh, going, Madam Chair, just just a couple. Oh, couple Mr. More, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just a couple of more points I, uh, I'd like to make, just in relation to uh, a couple other matters, uh, rather than thanking those other two people who were valuable members of the community. Uh, one is this uh, in this together 01864, you know, has been doing a fabulous job in relation to coordinating uh, support and effort for uh, uh, people in need through this pandemic. And that uh, if, I think they've done a, a fantastic job, obviously, and I uh, want to thank them for their service. But, you know, their coordination and their support is now transitioning. So it's important for people to know transitioning to uh, the Department of Elder Affairs, you know, so they've done a yeoman's work. Um, coordinating the efforts that were necessary for uh, our families that have been in need, particularly the senior citizens. Uh, and it's um, heartening to know that our uh, Department of Elder Affairs are now in a position to uh, 
uh, pick up the baton and carry it forward and uh, coordinate the support that's necessary for uh, the ongoing efforts there. Uh, additionally, uh, again, I'd, I'd like to congratulate Scott Buckley again for a while, his willingness to take on the, the chair of the school committee. Um, this past year, obviously, Madam Chair and myself had the opportunity of working with Scott uh, on the financial planning team and coordinating the whole host of other issues. Um, but we're, we're very fortunate uh, to have Scott uh, here in our community and uh, willing to serve and um, I'm um, heartened and happy to hear that he's willing to take it on again. Again, he's a, a level-headed, thoughtful, and uh, realistic and engaged individual. And uh, again, we're very lucky to have him and appreciate his, his willingness to continue to serve and uh, good for the school committee for allowing him to do so again as chair. Uh, additionally, I think it's important, Madam Chair, maybe the town administrator will talk about this later in his report, I'm not sure, but the um, it's important to note that the, the state legislature and the governor uh, have made a commitment to cities and towns to level fund um, certain local aid um, accounts, which is significant. Uh, even though they were only they're not able to get their own budget together, you know they, they put together an, an interim three month bud budget, which is going to take them through October. Um, but they did make a commitment. The chair of the Ways and Means Committees and the speaker and the Senate President and the governor all came together to give uh, local communities a, a sense of um, direction and also comfort. I think level that they're they're willing to commit to a level funding some of the uh, uh, cities and towns, uh, despite their own inability to put together a budget. So that's a huge, um, a huge commitment uh, on their part. And I, I think uh, the town administrator will address that a little bit later. And I think the only thing that maybe that the board may wanna take a position on, and again, it sounds a little political, but it really isn't, it's important, um, is that I think we need to voice some support for the uh, United States House proposal in the next coronavirus uh, relief bill, um, which would add additional support for states, cities, and towns to give us some additional relief for the additional costs that are associated with this, because the Senate proposal is just currently sitting there in these negotiations. It's not to offer any more money for the states, cities, and towns uh, for this additional cost. So I, I think we should probably go on record of uh, asking our delegation, uh, particularly our senators, to support the house version, which would add additional um, coronavirus support to cover the costs of states, cities, and towns. And I didn't know what the other members of the board felt in relation to that, but it's at a critical stage right now. And if we could under the uh, uh, signature of the chair, just send off a letter of support in the house version. I think it's important that uh, they hear from the ground, ground level up. Other than that, Madam Chair, all set. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. So we have a, a, a call to public hearing at eight, but we'll, let's try to get through the next few agenda items because we do have a lot of people that are um, attending this review of the special town meeting warrant articles. And for those of you who are attending for that portion of the meeting, if, if, there, if that is a, a portion that you want to make public comment on just hang in there um, because we're going to open up public comment generally right now but also when we reach that point of the uh, meeting this evening we're also going to open it up again to anyone that wants to participate at that point based um, on those agenda items on the special town meeting so right now we're going to do public comment which is what we have every meeting we have a public comment portion every meeting. And is there anyone who is in attendance that wishes to um, make any comment? What you can do is um, raise your hand. There's a raise hand function and it'll show um, Mr. Gilberto who is administering the Zoom call um, a raised hand, a raised blue hand. I don't see anybody, Mr. Gilberto. Um, the only way I think you're gonna be able to know of anyone joining us by phone is to unmute them. And then if you are joining us by phone and you want to part and make any kind of public comment, now I guess you're going to have to unmute them. You're muted. I'm muted. <laughs> Here I am. I'm going to unmute all. I would ask everybody who's at home following along um, just to Try to silence any background noise in your home because we're going to hear everybody at once for just a moment. And if you do wish to offer comment during public comment, 
please say, Madam Chair. Got everyone unmuted? I don't see any hands up. I'm not hearing any voices, Madam Chair. Oh, sorry, that didn't seem to work. Says all participants are unmuted, but I'm not all right. showing so, that. All right. For the moment, we don't have anyone that wants to uh, make public comment on, at least at this point. But again, we're gonna open that portion of the meeting when we come to the discussion of the, the virtual you know, meeting on the special, uh, special meeting warrant articles. We'll have the opportunity again to participate. Madam Chair, I am going Can to hear somebody. Everybody. I'm going to mute everybody right now, and then if you okay. could unmute yourself. All right. Thank you, Mr. I have to remember to unmute myself. We have um, next order of business, which is a COVID-19 update from Mr. Gilberto. And Madam Chair, through you, I'm going to forego the update at this point in time, just in the Thank you. Time. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, next order of business is to authorize the chair to sign the disclosure form for election worker candidates under Mass General Law Chapter 268A, Section 20B. And then we also have um, election workers. Mr. Gilberto. Very briefly, um, item number eight, uh, as it reads, would be to authorize the signing of a disclosure for an employee who is currently a call firefighter and has stepped forward to assist us as a poll worker at the elections. In order to do so, um, he would need to file a disclosure with the appointing authority, which um, the authority comes through the select board. Um, and so we are asking the board to authorize you to sign the disclosure form um, for the candidate. And then uh, his name is included in the, uh, the list of appointees under the next agenda item as a election worker. As, as you know, those positions are classified as special municipal employees. So with the appropriate disclosure, the candidate is able to hold both positions. He would not be doing both jobs at the same time though. Uh, and for the record, it is uh, call firefighter Jeff Strong, who is the individual. Right, so this is just a, a form that the State Ethics Commission requires an individual to um, file and, and it's a disclosure form and it's just explaining there's two separate and distinct uh, positions, but there's not really a conflict unless the members of this board see there to be a conflict. So if there's no question by the members on that, do I have a motion? Ms. <laughs> you have to unmute. Thank you, Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move to authorize the chair to sign the disclosure form for Jeff Strong pursuant to GLC 268A, that funny looking symbol 20B. Section. <laughs> Section. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. And again, it, it requires a, um, a pointing authority to sign off on it, which is by the order of, I guess, hierarchy here, right? Mr. Gilberto would be, it would fall to the chair of the select board to sign right. off. Correct. All right, so I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Do I have any further discussion of the members? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. And our next order is election workers. And I don't know if Clerk Stats is with us. Is she with us tonight? He typically joins us, but if not. Madam Chair, I can uh, speak to this. So again, this would be the customary appointment of election workers for um, the upcoming state uh, preliminary election. Um, this would also cover the period for um, early voting that will take place associated with that election. The board has customarily approved option number two, which is the appointment of the election officers from a list submitted by the registrars and as recommended by the registrars. And for the board members, you should have received an email from me earlier today with a revised list. It unfortunately reflects removing um, Deacon, um, Deacon Al from the listing. He was a poll worker for the town in addition to his other 
contributions to the community and a couple of additions that came in as well in the past few days. Um, so that memorandum is separately in the share file folder um, for appointments. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. It's on page 29 and typically the board, you know, we hear from um, clerk stats and clerk stats makes a recommendation. And again, she's asked us to choose option two to give her greater flexibility in, you know, ha having these individuals available um, and she, you know, can coordinate that. So if there's no questions, do I have a motion? Madam Chair. I move to exercise the following option for appointment of election workers for elections held between September 1st, 2020 through August 31st, 2021. Appoint election officers from the list submitted by the registrars as recommended by the registrars. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And uh, uh, Manu Pelli is aye. All right. Our next order of business is to um, meet with the Martin's Pond Committee to discuss funding for an ongoing ongoing pond treatment. And thank you for your patience. No, <laughs> I we, know we, you we, want to jump right in on this. No, we, we first want to thank you. I'm, you know, so my name is George Cangiano and I'm the chair of the Martin's Pond Reclamation Study Committee. And I took over as chair a, a couple of years ago when Janet Nicosia stepped down. So a lot of this is, is, is new for me, but I just want to say that Rich Walner has been a terrific liaison for us. And, you know, he believes in the pond and we believe in the pond. So uh, I really want to be sensitive to time here. So I want to be succinct. I mean, we have a formal presentation we'd love to show you, but we'll let you let us know if that's something you'd like to move forward with. So um, I'm not sure how many remember uh, back in 2014, we were having a really bad problem in the pond with a invasives. Eurasian milfoil and variable milfoil. And it was really having ill effects on the pond. People had a tough time kayaking, boating, wildlife was suffering. It was really, really bad. So we approached the town for help. And, you know, really right now, every lake and, and pond in the U.S. is struggling with controlling invasives because once they're in, they're in. It's all about managing. You're never going to eradicate them. So it's been six years since we've approached the town. And in January or February at the town meeting, we were granted fifty thousand uh, dollars that was approved was given to us to manage the plan for the pond. And we've been very judicious with those funds. Um, we've managed treatments. We did one in 2015. We treated again in 2017, and it's really kept the invasives at bay. Uh, to the point that the pond can be used again. You know, we have kayakers, we have wildlife, we have boaters, we have swimmers, all of these things. But we're, we're, we need to come back to the town again because the variable milfoil is really growing at a rapid rate. So, you know, instead of keeping everybody on the hook through a presentation, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? We're looking for $25,000 so we can treat in June of 2021. And there's a new chemical that uh, Jim Greer will be able to speak to. It's called Percelicor. Uh, that's been new for the last few years since we originally treated. And it comes with a three-year guarantee uh, on all milfoil within the pond. And Jim's had personal experience with that through Solitude Lake Management. And it showed a really, really good result. And we do have some funds left over from the original funding that we have to do with invasives such as fan wart and curly pond leaf because uh, pond weed because there are other invasives in the pond so as you know the, the pond is one of the main recreation spots and we want to keep it that way and we've made a commitment but we really need the town's help once again um, so we have a presentation for you tonight I'm, I'm happy to show that to you we can go through it rather quickly I just wanted to kind of be up front and get the ask out and what we're looking for so I, I leave it up to the select board I can share my screen and I can go through that pretty quickly. I don't know if there's consensus to see that. Sure, I, I think that's fine. I think we received that um, a little bit earlier today. And if Mr. Greer, if there's anything, if there's anything you 
want to add to that in, in regard to the request? There you go. So was this the presentation that you received earlier today? Uh, not that first page. No. Yeah, not really <laughs> that page. What's after that? Not that first page anyway. Yeah. All right. So I just wanted to give everybody, yeah, did, did you see this, the, the history of the pond? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you, yes, yes. This okay. is part of what you sent. It was in bigger letters and it wasn't probably as, how many pages is your presentation? Well, this was, so I had taken this and I'd worked on it earlier today. I didn't know Jim sent that to you already. So my apologies. Yes, no, that's okay. It was very informative. It was great. So you saw the uh, we we were able to read it, but we do have a lot of individuals attending and are probably interested in this topic. So if you want to just do a quick run sure. through, that would be great. Sure, I, I will keep this very brief. So here's history. We started this journey in 2014. The growth was so pronounced that again, like I talked to, it really impacted recreational activities. Um, we engaged the state, local aquatic expert and aquatic control technologies, which is now Solitude. Um, like I said, in January, February, the town, uh, we were granted 50,000 for a year over year treatment plan. Um, there's still remaining funds, but really not enough to support the necessary treatment that we need in 2021 because milfoil again is really evident. Uh, so to that end, we're looking for 25,000 to fund the treatment. And that'll have a three-year guarantee on milfoil growth. Remaining funds that we've really managed over the years will be used to treat other invasives like fan wart and curly pond weed in the off years. So and we've been extremely uh, prudent and judicial with spend because we know how precious resources are. Um, so 2015, we treated the entire pond with diquat and it was hugely effective and really wiped out all of the milfoil. Procellicor wasn't available at the time. So with Diquat, we knew it was only going to last a little over a year, but it really gave us that full punch. So we could now manage the spot, the growth by spot treatments in the pond. So, but when you wipe out one invasive that left root, the room for fan wart, wort and curly pond leaf to grow. So it's almost like kind of a whack-a-mole when you're managing this stuff. Uh, in July, 2016, we had divers come in and, and pull the variable milfoil. And then in late May and July 2017, we treated the fan wart and variable milfoil using a pelletized herbicide called sonar. And that was the last treatment. And that was kind of the promise to the town with our management plan that we were going to take the big swing at the pond, which we did. And then we were going to spot treat. But because we haven't treated since 2017 and there are new treatment options, the growth is prevalent. Um, we had solitude map the pond and the variable milfoil growth is significant around the edges along with curly pond weed. And that was really bad this year, but that kind of dies off. That doesn't mean it's not going to come back next year with a vengeance. So Jim, do you mind taking over from here to talk about water quality and the specifics of the treatment moving forward? Sure. Greetings. Uh, so I'm new to town. I just moved in last year and Welcome. Uh, thank you. And uh, learned that uh, Apparently, the lake was the pond was close to swimming. Although they came back to the house and saw people water skiing, so I was confused. But since people do swim in the lake, we decided it was probably useful to do some testing. Uh, we did some E. coli and phosphorus tests. Um, did some E. coli testing at the inlet, the outlet, and the and the deep spot. And in all three cases, we were less than seven colonies per hundred milliliters. And you can see the mass limits 126 as a geometric mean. So we're we're really well below that. I wouldn't drink it, but as far as uh, it being it, in the it, water, you're okay. Yeah. And that's really a testament to a lot of the new construction uh, that have, you know, with Title V, because I bet you if you did that 10 years ago, it wouldn't have that result. And, and I know that's been very important to the town. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jim. I just wanted to make that point. The other significant number, there's a number of uh, tests you can take, but the other number is, is phosphorus, which is the uh, driving uh, nutrient in fresh water. And our phosphorus level is high. Um, it's evident um, because you know it goes, the water comes in through the swamp area, a lot of, a lot of decay. And we're, we're at 40 uh, parts per billion at the inlet and at the deep spot, and I didn't bother the outlet. And that's, that's pretty high. 50 is considered to be the lake is in eutrophication where it's bas basically fertilized water. And so the, I'm not sure what we can do about that. That's what we got there. Um, 
So non-invasives we have of note, lily pads, water shield, bladder wart. Uh, they're natural and uh, they've been here and they can be annoying, but that's life. The other problem is cyanobacteria. Uh, I believe there was a, a bloom three years ago. It's always present, it's natural. It's been here for about 3 billion years. Um, when it blooms, it's a severe health threat to the extent that it causes death in you know, dogs and uh, people with impaired immune systems. Uh, we're monitoring, I, I, I go out regularly to take a look. We're still looking okay at the moment. Uh, August is a dangerous time. Invasive species we have, we know we have fanwort, Eurasian milfoil, and I believe that the original treatment did not cover variable milfoil because it was not seen at the time. Uh, we have water chestnut and curly pondweed. Um, so the water chestnut is annual, it floats, it grows like mad, but we, we caught one and we, we hand pulled it in the past month. Curly pond, we, like George said, was here and then disappeared. Uh, we'll monitor for that. Uh, in the surveys, the times I've gone around in the kayak, I've only found two specimens of fanwort this year. Um, but the Eurasian, and, and especially the variable milfoil, is pervasive along the shores. I went out in June and took pictures and uh, a very place that was putting up flower spikes and it was it's quite there. And you, if you're out there, you can see the long ropey pieces of uh, variable milfoil. Uh, I had a lot of experience hand pulling this up in New Hampshire, uh, but uh, it, that's a, a real uh, loser at this point. Uh, this is the map we received from Solitude for the pond. Um, so basically, yeah, we got stuff all around. Um, and you know, the good part is we don't, you know, there's, there's not much in the middle. Technically, this pond is a lake because the sun can't reach the bottom in the middle because the water's so dark. And then I did a survey. You can see that ugly picture, which is the variable milfoil. Of, and there, there are ugly flowers poking through the surface. And then there's just some um, algae scum uh, stuck there as well. And in 2014, that was pretty much an entire mat that encompassed the whole perimeter of the pond. So wading out or swimming or kayaking left it, it was near impossible. In, and in I've got two uh, URLs here that went to an all trails map I did. I did not have a good way to get it into the thing, but <clears throat> if you were to follow those, they would also pick up all the pictures that were taken. You can see some of them down there. Okay, so good. Mr. Um, Greer, can you submit um, a copy of what you just went through to Mr. Gilberto so that we can have it um, for people to look through? What we, what we received was sort of a um, an abbreviated version of that. Sure. I will, I will send this first thing tomorrow so you have That'd it. be great, yes. And, and, and should I send it to Karen or to Rich? Um, I think you could send it to Karen and Mr. Gilberto um, yes. so that if members of the public want to look at it in more depth or in more detail that, that you would have it. Um, I, I don't mean to disrupt you if you were, uh, were you finished Mr. Greer? I'm pretty much, I'm just about done. Uh, the, big, right. the big thing and, and it, it's really uh, Procella Core is a new, new uh, EPA approved minimal risk chemical diquat, a 2,4-D, which is not legal in Massachusetts, and sonar are a broader spectrum. They take higher concentrations and uh, they're more disruptive. Uh, the lake I was associated with avoided using any treatment for eight years before we used Procella Core. We did a lot of hand diving. Um, the Procella Core went in and it's been two years since we treated and it took out everything in the treated area, uh, stretching a mile and a half down beyond the treatment area because the river flows out of the lake up in uh, Ringe, New Hampshire. Uh, it was quite amazing. It's, I, was, I used to watch the, the weed float into my shore up there all year and this year, there's, the past two years, there's been none. So it's, 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 it's quite remarkable. And uh, they're very, you know, uh, the three-year guarantee, any regrowth, more than 10% of the area, they'll come back and retreat it in three years. So 
Uh, quite good. Okay. So you had, you had, I'm going to ask the members if they have any questions of you, but yep. basically since 2015, you have managed to clean and clear with the $50,000 that was earmarked and you have managed that fund and managed to resolve a lot of these issues. Now you're looking for an additional 25,000 to combine with what's left over. How much you have left over from that 50,000 that you've had for all these years you using it. Sounds like you've been watching every penny of that. Every so penny. How, how much is left over of that? We have uh, 17,000 is left. And if we, and that's not enough to use Priscilla Corps. And we figure if we can ask the town for another 25,000 that buys us three years on the mill foil, and then we can use that 17,000 to treat the other invasive. So we've really thought deeply about this. So that particular treatment is only designed to um, eradicate one particular type of infiltrate. That's right. Okay. Mill foils, uh, hydrilla, which fortunately we don't have, mm -hmm. and uh, crested floating heart which we also don't have, but it is very specific, which is one of the nice things. It does not kill off uh, That's right. even other plants. That's right. Because as we've said from the beginning, we're really balancing the health of wildlife, of uh, non-invasive non plants. So this is even, it even works better from what we understand, so. All right, so let's have um, the members that have any questions and we'll, <laughs> Talk to Mr. Gilberto, I think. Mr. Earl Leary. Uh, first of all, I, again, I applaud Mons Pond Reclamation Committee uh, for all their efforts over all these years. And again, Janet Nicosia and her group uh, long ago, and you're picking up the baton and moving forward with it. It's, it's greatly appreciated because Mons Pond is truly a, uh, a gem, a treasure, and a, and a resource uh, that I, I don't believe most of the community is aware of or has ever been to a scene, unfortunately, and they, and they really should. Uh, my wife and I have been over there to kayak, and it's just a beautiful um, resource that we need to um, invest more in, as far as I'm concerned, and have been supportive over all these years. So my question is, is you know, I'm in support of the $25,000 you're looking for, but what do we really need from a maintenance standpoint, ongoing maintenance standpoint? And to me, there should be a line item in the budget uh, to, Steve, that's a great question and, and one that we really appreciate because Jim and I have been talking about that where, you know, there's so much, it's a lot to manage all this and we understand that we're using towns, town funds, so we need to be smart about it. But if there was a line item that would just carry, you know, because it's a commitment from the town to the pond, you know, that would be ideal. And Jim, you know, you, you had... Jim has a lot more experience than I do because he's managed this for a lot longer up in New Hampshire. I mean, Jim, what 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 figure would you put out there? Well, fortunately, our lake only had variable milfoil. That was enough to keep us going. Um, but I would think that uh, if we knock the milfoil back and and basically eradicate it, which is actually something that can be talked about this stuff, um, then I would think something in the order of ten to fifteen thousand a year, uh, averaged out, is about what we'd need to, to keep track of this. I mean, just and also minor things. I mean, uh, George and I picked up the uh, the testing because we hadn't passed a motion on it, and that's that's fairly cheap. It's like thirty five bucks a sample. Yeah. Uh, we want to test the water, so that's a small thing. But the the big part would be probably spot treatment with sonar, um, where we have outbreaks. Yeah. And one of the things that we've been doing, Jim mentioned water chestnut. If that is left to go, now you're talking about another invasive that you have to treat. And we've been going out and pulling that. Jim and I spent two days filling up boats with the water chestnut. It's not a fun job, but you know what? It, it saved thousands of dollars. And we're going to continue to do that several times a year. And that's just people that live on the pond, just us that go up. In fact, Rich saw me paddling back one of the boats full of water <laughs> chestnut as well. It was probably not a pretty sight, but it was anyway. not a pretty sight. <laughs> no, but, but to me, you know, I think we need to uh, to make a stronger commitment and, and either put it in, you know, parks and recreation or Combination parks, recreation under the direction of the Department of Public Works, um, because it's an ongoing battle. And again, it's always been 
playing a little bit of second fiddle, you know, until, you know, the, the Janets of the world came forward and, you know, made us take notice and, yeah. you know, put it in our face and say, you know, listen, this is what we have here. We have a resource that we're not investing in and we're losing it. And uh, if you lose it, it's even worse. It's a worse situation. So, you know, to me, you know, if it's, you know, 10 or $15,000 a year uh, for this tremendous resource that I think more people in the community should be taking advantage of. Now, the people over the Martins Pond area might not like that because everybody coming over there, but uh, it, it, it really is a, a fabulous uh, uh, place to recreate. And, and to me, we need to do more. And again, we were out there in June and things were really starting to bloom a little bit. And I'm sure it's worse now. We haven't been back over in the last yeah. month or so, but, um, you know, it just gets worse, worse as the weather gets warmer. It does. Uh, so to, to me, you know, you have my full support for the 25,000, but to me, I think we need to make a, a stronger commitment. I would urge my fellow board members to encourage the administration to include a, a line item. And you can pick Mr. Town Administrator where you want to place it, but you know, whether it be Parks and Recreation or DPW or create a hybrid, I don't care. Um, <clears throat> I, I just think we need to keep after it. Okay, um, we don't have a vote on tonight. This was a presentation that was put in and we do have a virtual um, review of Article Warren. So I think maybe what we would do if, um, if there's no specific questions directed at the presentation is we'll have you come back at another meeting. I appreciate all the information you've presented, but we do really have to move on to the um, article, uh, special <laughs> town meeting article review. Um, and it wasn't, it's not on for a vote yet. And I think there's a lot more information. Mr. O'Leary's raising uh, a lot more information than what your presentation was, it had explained to us. That's, that's fine. This is a process. I, I was on sure. finance committee no, many years ago. I think it's wonderful. And I think it's very informative, but I, on this evening's meeting, I'm not sure if, um, we can really talk about budget requisition, requisition at this meeting. However, it would be something for a future meeting, you know, one of our next uh, planned meetings after the special town meeting for us to consider. Um, but that I think that we should be considering that $25,000 for this particular purpose. And the, in, in your um, experience, the 10,000 um, for the reg regular line item, if there's a way that that could be managed. But I do want to just give the other members an opportunity to ask questions if you have questions with regard to the presentation, because we're, we really do have to move on. And we have people that are waiting to maybe participate with regard to the special town meeting agenda item. And this was, this was, um, um, that was, we really need to move on to that. So let's, let's go with questions of the members. Mr. Walner. Uh, just um, just to be brief, um, the uh, the reason why I was asking them to get in sooner than later is because the money they're seeking, I think the warrant for October town meeting has to be in by August 17th. So I don't know if we're going to have a chance to get another meeting in for them to ask for that 25000 So, um, And it's really important that they do it in the spring of next year to have it be the most effective. So mm -hmm. that's why we were, and we can, I, I know we can add warrants after this date, but we were looking at the August 17th date as the issue. So if nothing else, the 25,000, whether we deal with this now or later, by the October town meeting to be able to get an override, we'd have to bring it up. We'd have to get it into the into the, into the warrant. So that was, the, that was the main reason why I asked them to do it as quick as possible. Okay, thanks, Mr. Walner. Do you have any other, it seems like you're pretty familiar with this anyway from working with the committee. Yeah, I mean, as you can tell, these guys really know what's going on and they're, right. they're watching it like no one else I know. I met with them, I was overly impressed. And I live here, you know, and I, yeah. they're, they're as good as I've ever seen. Yes, thank you, Mr. Walner. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions of the information? No questions, just a thank you. Uh, it was very informative, very, very well, well done. And I learned a lot. Thank you. And Mr. Studo, any questions? No, same as Mrs. Gonzalez, just thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm fairly new to town, so you know it's nice to uh, know a little bit more and get educated on all the different areas of uh, you know North Reading. And Martin's Pond is one that gets talked about a good amount, and usually I'm you know scratching my head up until like the last like couple months. So thank you. Oh, it's thank a great you. place to take little kids. There's a park. 
playground. You know, when we first they moved there, they had these big <laughs> Halloween bashes there. They were all uh, they were they were a blast. Mr. Gilberto, um, I'm going <laughs> to ask you about the financial request in light of the. Uh, I mean, it, it, we can't call it urgent because of the fact that it just came to our attention this past week. But in light of the fact with respect to October town meeting, is there a means to fund this? And we're in the midst of COVID-19 with an uncertainty of our budget as it is. And so, is there grant funding that might be available for this? It, it's possible that there could be grant funding out there for it. Um, I think really, the, the first question is just probably going to be the vehicle, meaning are, are we going to have a, a warrant article on for October to even consider this? I don't expect that we will have a firm answer about the ability to fund this in October come the deadline for warrant article submission, because we don't normally have the whole, whole picture of the fall financial um, picture at that point anyway, and this year it's going to be a bit more challenging. Mr. O'Leary mentioned we did get some encouraging news. Um, but that encouraging news is, you know, will partially offset a number of reductions if we choose to use it in that fashion that were made from existing operating requests. So I think an option the board could consider is to place a warrant on the draft um, of the October town meeting warrant when it's reviewed on August 17th. And like you mentioned, Mrs. Uh, Madam Chair, we could ask the committee to come back and maybe talk a bit further about, you know, some of the long term planning. Yep. That would be great. I think every single from my what i'm hearing from my colleagues every single one of us would be in in favor of that and we have done that for other initiatives that if we can't locate the funding or move forward we would pass it over till the next town meeting ideally we wouldn't have to do that but i think if i could just quickly can we get a majority consent i'm going to ask you by name if that's what you want mr gilberto to do for that october town meeting mr o'leary absolutely mrs gonzalez yes mr walner yes mr studo yes and manny pelly is a yes for that moving forward with that and perhaps we can figure out another time for you to i think it was pretty concise presentation and we can see the if you go there or you visit there, we can see the difference. So we know the work is is yielding positive results. So um, we really appreciate your dedication to it. And we we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. All right. Okay. Thanks for waiting too. And to all of the attendees, I think we're gonna move on to the next order of business which is the um virtual warrant article informational hearing on the august 8 2020 special town meeting so we have um the warrant was issued and it was mailed to everyone and this is that special town meeting and we have a reduced quorum for the special town meeting that we voted on um which is uh only 15 voters so we're probably going to make that with the committees that are in attendance and it's going to be where our plan is to have it outdoors but we appreciate people attending to ask questions this evening or um, provide their public input of their public concerns just like you would do if you attended a town a special town meeting in person so the article one actually is with regard to the acquisition appropriation and conveyance for 14 Concord Street, which is, uh, we're familiar with that well, seven, well. seven acres well, turkey we farm. Town support of can you, can you hear me? Okay. All right. So if we want to go one by one for these, and if the map, if my colleagues would like to, discuss where what their position is on I think that would be a good starting off point um the ba basically basically okay Mr. Gilberta you can start <laughs> no, I just would note that there is a hearing notice for this it's on page uh, 46 oh, yes. of the packet. Must read that. I'm sorry read, read that and then Madam Chair I do have a brief PowerPoint presentation which I've uploaded into this evening's share file folder if you'd like me to take us through that and 
I'll certainly stop at the end of Article One, and we can have discussion if you'd like. So, Mr. Studo, do you want to read that, or do you want me to read that? Which one? I got a couple here. Just to start the, the, the notice of hearing. Yep, the number eleven, right? Which one? I can't. Uh, it's it's uh, if you're in the packet. Yeah. Page 46 of the meeting packet. It says notice of virtual informational hearing. Oh, okay. I see. All right. Yeah. It's not a motion. It's just the, uh, the hearing notice itself. 46. Yep. I can read it. Uh, notice of virtual informational hearing town and North Reading. The North Reading Board of uh, Selectmen does hereby notify the residents of the town of North Reading that a virtual hearing on the following articles contained in the August 8, 2020, previously May 11, 2020, special town meeting warrant will be held Monday, August 3rd, 2020, 8 p.m. The hearing may be accessed as follows. The hearing will represent an opportunity for residents to learn more about the articles in the special town meeting warrant, to ask questions and to engage in discussion in advance of the special town meeting. A listing of warrant articles is as follows. Acquisition, appropriation, and conveyance, 14 Concord Street. Acquisition, appropriation, and conveyance, 4 and 12 Concord Street. Amend FY 2020 operating budget. The hearing is held pursuant to sections 18 to 25 of chapter 30A of the Massachusetts General Laws. Any interested citizen is welcome to virtually attend and participate in the hearing. It is the unanimous desire of the North Reading Select Board to encourage and allow the highest level of public participation in making decisions that affect North Reading. This warrant article hearing is intended to represent an opportunity for extended virtual discussion in advance of the special town meeting. We sincerely hope that you will join us for this hearing on August 3rd, 2020 at 8 p.m. Sign the Select Board, North Reading. Mr. Gilberto, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do apologize. I just heard that the first line referred to the Board of Selectmen. So I apologize to the board. I know that the name is Select Board. I don't know how we missed that change. I'm going to share my screen. Madam I'm going Chair. to assume everybody knows that's us anyway, because <laughs> we have a lot of participants. So it, 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 its purpose of notification was achieved. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, I will uh, share my screen to go through a PowerPoint presentation again for the board members. If you're in the share file meeting folder for this evening, um, this document is in there in a PDF format as well, if you want to follow along. All right. And is everybody able to see a slide that says special town meeting? Yes. Great. Moving right through then, again, some information as was referenced by the chair. This meeting was called on February 29th from May 11th to consider the town's option to purchase the seven acres poultry farm. After the onset of the public health emergency, the moderator continued the special town meeting ultimately to this upcoming Saturday, August 9th, August 8th at nine o'clock AM at Arthur Kenny Turf Field at North Reading Middle High School. Um, the select board, as the chair mentioned, in consultation with the town moderator, reduced the quorum requirement from 150 to 15 voters as allowed by recently approved state law there was notice of a meeting that was held to discuss that as well as notice of a decision published in the North Reading transcript. This evening is an opportunity for the public to learn more, to ask questions and to participate in discussion in advance of special town meeting. Article one relative to 14 Concord Street would authorize the acquisition, appropriation of funding and the ability to convey 14 Concord Street. The town has an option to purchase, purchase this agricultural property, commonly known as Seven Acres Poultry Farm. The request to town meeting is for authorization to acquire the property and to appropriate $1,120,000 from the proceeds of the sale of town old land for the purchase as well as to demolish buildings on the property. Two thirds of the voters present at the town meeting would be required to approve. And we have some additional information on some upcoming slides that I will go through. A little bit about the town's option to purchase in accordance with state law, chapter 61A, the current owner has had their prop property tax obligation reduced in exchange for maintaining an agricultural use at the property. The owner is required under state law to provide the town a copy of any agreement to sell the property and the town has an option to meet the conditions in that agreement. The owner has notified the town that he has an agreement to sell the property for $1.1 million 
and the town estimates an additional $20,000 in demolition costs associated with three um, barn buildings that are on the property. A little bit about the property, it's 14.10 acres, zoned Residence A, with 114 feet of frontage on Concord Street. It abuts a two-family and single-family home, which have common ownership, being the same owner, as well as Bobcat of Boston, a paper street, which is to the east, the Ipswich River, and the Reading Town Line to the south, as well as a privately owned parcel to the southwest. The property contains a dirt driveway, three barn buildings, and former agricultural fields. This is an overview from the town's GIS system. You can see the property has frontage on Concord Street and the three shed buildings that are somewhat visible through this area between the house and a larger barn building. It goes all the way back to the town line here and the Ipswich River. A little about the proposed private party sale, which has triggered the town's option. The seller is the owner, Paul Magliozzi. The proposed private buyer is Concord Street Realty Trust with a principal identified as Sergio Coviello. Proposed sale price between the owner and the buyer is $1.1 million. And under state law, the town cannot negotiate the purchase price. A little bit about the town's research regarding development and wetlands on or near the property. And uh, there's some reports that we've um, identified and have put on the town website. So if you are watching from home and wanna follow along, if you go right to the homepage on the town's website, you'll see a link to special town meeting information that references a hearing tonight. If you click on that link, right up at the, uh, pretty much the third paragraph are three links to reports that we're gonna summarize here. Um, wetlands regulations may reduce the number of buildable lots in the, from, on the subdivision um, to five buildable lots. A provision in the town's bylaw could allow development by the North Reading Housing Authority to a density of between 18 and 21 units if the town desired to do so. A maximum development build-out scenario could yield 81 and two-bedroom units with a septic system capacity under 10,000 gallons per day, which is the requirement, um, the maximum that you can have for a, a traditional septic, um, septic system style. And these are options that would be in addition to the property potentially remaining undeveloped or designated as open space. Additional environmental research that we conducted on the property is a lot of technical things that go into this. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna leave the slides up there, but sort of summarize as I was speaking. Um, there were some metals that were identified um, in material that was suspected to be fill on the site. Um, it uh, triggered detection by laboratory detection limits, but below what they call a reportable uh, level, meaning that something that needs to be reported to the, uh, to the state for a formal, formal action. Um, there was a limited subsurface investigation uh, looking at concentrations that would exceed those reporting categories and did not detect anything that would exceed those categories in the soil or groundwater at the site. Um, there was an identification of um, a chemical identified as PCE, which is associated with a nearby uh, released um, uh, underground of chemical from the 70 Concord Street site nearby. Uh, it was identified in groundwater, um, likely evidence of a Concord Street plume potentially having migrated to the southern portion of the site, kind of along the Ipswich River. Um, it was identified as something that we've highlighted here for the community to be aware of, but I would note, um, um, I would note that our engineer reported to us that this was um, something that was identified um, through testing, but does not trigger uh, the formal reporting requirement um, uh, to the state and um, yeah, the planning required with that for cleanup. Um, should the resource, meaning the land, be slated for use in future development plans, further evaluation may be warranted. Um, our consultant, Weston and Sanson, was unable to install wells um, at some of the locations. However, our, their field observations and soil data indicated that the groundwater at the loca locations were likely not change the findings or conclusions of the, uh, of the report. Mr. Gilberto, I don't yes. mean to interrupt you, but the board voted to make those public. Are those available for um, uh, members of the town to read? Are they available online? They are. So if the, anyone is watching at home now or after now, after this point, you can click on the town's webpage at www.northreadingma.gov. And on the homepage is an, uh, a link to special town meeting information, specifically tonight's hearing. And a third paragraph 
there are three separate file links with that, that are under a paragraph called information regarding the town's review of the properties. And so there are three reports, one of them is very lengthy, that are available for the public to look at. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. But that concludes the presentation with regard to Article 1, Madam Chair. Okay. So, so let's first, I'd like just to, um, if my colleagues want to make any, have any input at this point, and then we're going to turn it to open to anyone, any members, of any members of the public attending that wish to speak in favor or against this or just give their input or ask any questions. Um, Mr. O'Leary, let's start with you. Well, actually, I'll be brief uh, in the beginning here, which is, you know, unusual, I'm sure. You're surprised, uh, Madam Chair. I, I mean, I just like to say it up front that I'm in favor of the town purchasing uh, the property. You know, I think it's a, a key sp keystone or linchpin to uh, uh, development on Concord Street in light of um, it's not very often that we have an opportunity. The town has an opportunity to step into a private deal uh, with a preset price at market prices rather than having to enter and engage in any activity such as eminent domain and uh, having the price settled later on generally at a higher price. So this is a, uh, an opportunity that doesn't present itself very often. I think the location of the property is critical when it comes to uh, economic development or whether it be open space or whether it be affordable housing or whatever uh, town meeting at a future town meeting would decide uh, what the value of the property is going to be. Uh, I think we have the resources currently uh, you know, from the sale of the JT Berry property to fund the acquisition of this, uh, retain it as an asset, and should town meeting decide later on and the board decide later on to sell the asset through an RFP process or, uh, or retain it for open space or any other purposes, you know, it provides us an opportunity that we wouldn't normally have. Uh, but I, I'm actually awaiting public input in relation to questions and concerns and uh, then we'll address uh, fully what I believe uh, is the rationale for uh, purchasing it. So, All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner, do you have anything you want to add or comment or? Um, well, I guess I'll, I think I believe I'll be the, the sole uh, select board member who is not in favor of pursuing this property simply because um, we have other priorities in town that have to be considered. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll explain this more on Saturday because it'll take longer to explain. But I feel like, uh, you know, we're going to be going after that $20 million that we have sitting in the bank for these kind of purposes and taking away one to $2 million for this purpose takes away our ability to achieve other goals that we, that we have in town that many committees are working for and uh, striving for that people are just not aware of. So I don't think it's the best use of our funds um, uh, is the way I should, would be going. Thank um, you. I'll be brief. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mr. Studo. Anything to add? Uh, I'll just piggyback on Mr. O'Leary's comments. I think uh, a parcel of this size, where it is, location, and if you take a look at some of the long-term strategic goals for the town, I think that it's something where um, whether or not we end up using it for that specific thing, I'd rather acquire it or you know, I'd rather the town acquire it for the per for the many different purposes rather than regret the opportunity to acquire it. Which um, you know, uh, I've I've noticed if you if you look at the past, I mean, there's just been a lot of things where later on people have said, "I wish we did this five, ten years ago," and it ends up costing the town a lot more money. And I think this could be one of those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Studio. Mrs. Gonzalez, anything? Um, I just want to say, um, well, I'm, I am for it. And my main reason for being for it is so that we can be in control of it. I think it's important for us to know and decide what happens there rather than let it go and have somebody else decide what goes there. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. And um, though the, the, um, Though the article as published says that we're gonna make our recommendation at town meeting, it is a topic that we've addressed um, in terms of the transaction. Uh, and we have discussed it and Mr. Walner is accurate when he says that, that he's, the, he's the only one that's opposed to it for all the reasons that he has repeatedly asserted. And I'm in favor of it as well. 
Um, I think it, I'm all, I've been in favor of it since the beginning for open space, for pr preservation of open space, but also open to the potential um, the potential that this could have for development down the line. So let's open this up to questions for attendees, um, questions as well as comments and some input from the members of the public that are attending. If anyone has any um, questions or comments or input on article one. Mr. Gilberti, you're gonna have to help me with this one. I don't see any hands raised and I see nothing in the chat room except for Mr. Healy, but I don't think he meant for this portion. I oh, I see Mr. Gannon, you have your hand raised. If you could state your full name and address. Hi, my name is Jeff Gannon. I live at 3 Linwood Avenue. Uh, I'm not too far from this site. And uh, I think the uh, presentation that was given was good. It was nice to hear um, about the testing that was done. Um, and some of the studies, although they were numbers only about what might be done um, uh, or what could be done on the property. Um, I think it'd be a mistake to spend the money and purchase this and not do anything. Um, we have great open space here. I, I think maybe part of that lot could be maintained for that. But if the town were to purchase it, I would, I would hope that there would be um, a lot of support for doing something there. I think it's a, a good opportunity with the location and the size. Um, a lot of good things said by uh, the select board members, I think um, that are in favor of it. So um, I think most of my questions were answered, which was good. I haven't made a decision on support or not yet. So I'd be interested to hear what other people say, but um, I think if the select board and planning commission and others um, could really see uh, something here, then it's definitely worth purchasing this size of property and the location it is for the price that it appears we can get it at, in my opinion. Um, but I think it's, I'm an architect and I do a lot of studies. Um, the art, the mention of the RFP is what came to my mind when I started reading about this in the paper. Um, and it, it is an opportunity for the town to be able to decide what they want there and sort of feed via an RFP um, what we what we envision for that uh, and you look you can look to avoid um, certain conflicts that you might have at like Elm Street for example um, and in other places when you're in control of it so I think there needs to be some good intent if there if it's going to be purchased um, so that would be my account comment on it so thank you thanks mr. Gannon all right, anybody else that would like to comment? You can raise your hand. See Mr. Putney? Oh, Mr. Putney. Just on, you have to unmute. Is it unmuted? Yes. Okay, I'm Don Putney, 20 Riverside Drive, North Reading. I live fairly close to the Ipswich River, and there have, four have been watching the Ipswich River Watershed Committee and the activities of the river, realizing that this is the third most endangered river in the country, according to their statistics. I think it's a responsibility of this town, especially since we're so far up the river and everything we do, do affects those communities down the river, which is more than 100,000 people. So I think we have some responsibility and based on that, I would applaud the uh, members of the select board who have said, let's buy it and see what we need to do with it cautiously. I am very much in favor of that and I thank them for their comments. Thank you, Mr. Putney. Do anyone else would like to speak on this? Madam Chair, if you'd like, I will unmute all and just ask if you don't have anything to add, if you could just remain silent and if you wish to be heard, um, raise your voice. I'm gonna click unmute all. Because it's not true. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't think that was intended for us, but um, I didn't hear anybody asking to speak though. <laughs> And I was muted and it definitely wasn't me, although it does sound like my house. <laughs> so 
Let's try that one more time because we do have a lot of phone participants. Sure. Folks, Here's if you aren't, if you're joining us by phone and you don't want to speak, please just, we're trying to manage this and it's, it's a virtual meeting right now. So please just give others the opportunity to participate. Here we go. <laughs> Better. All right. Now, for the folks joining us at, from your phone, please just speak up if you'd like to contribute to this discussion. Just please state your name and your address for us. Yeah, I'd like to say something, if I could. My, my name is Paul De Niro. Paul De Niro. Um, I, I live at 402 Park Street, which is adjacent to the, um, to the, to, to the Seven Acre uh, Poultry Farm. To the east, and and uh, my concern, I guess, is that that I I think the town should have a should should have a uh, you know a firm reason to purchase it because I think the the residents in, in the town, at least me anyway, I'm thinking that I'd like to know what it's going to be used for rather than to just buy a space of land and either turn it into open property or or senior housing units or individual houses, um, you know, since I'm so close to it, uh, it would certainly impact me one way or the other. That's my comment. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dianero. Can you spell your last name too for us, please? Yes, D-E-N-A-R-O, one word, small n. D-N-A-R-O. Okay. So, Mr. De Niro, if I could just um, understand that you're, you would be opposed to it unless there's a plan in place for development of it. Right. If you said you're going to put five houses there or you're going to put, you know, at least we, we would know what, what the town is, is, going to, uh, is going to provide the money for and what the town is going to get, get for it. Um, you know, some people may like open space, and I doubt it's going to be. Who knows what's going to happen? But but I would I would think that that something would probably be built there. So I guess the question is, what would you have? Well, in, in my case, I guess I'm I'm speaking selfishly, even though I'm speaking for the town. I, I should be speaking for the town, but it it would it would um, make a difference to me whether it was going to be. Um, Industrial buildings, or, or uh, ten, you know, like senior housing units or individual homes. So I think it's important right now for um, Mr. Gilberto. Can you explain what the zoning that exists there? What can be built there right now? So if the town does not move forward and acquire this parcel. Uh, any individual who does acquire it has a number of de development options available, um, either under zoning or by seeking a uh, uh, per seeking permitting from our permitting um, boards to be able to develop something else there or whatever they whatever they want. So right now, the current use by right is is residential. So it's zoned for residential use, and there is sufficient land area to divide the 14-acre uh, parcel that we're talking about right now, which does not include the single-family or two-family home abutting Concord Street. God, God bless you. Thank you. Bad timing. <laughs> I couldn't even get to the mute button in time. Um, it, the property, well, there's land area to develop seven lots. Uh, we believe through our review, um, it's more likely to accommodate five lots just based on the environmental regulations associated with the wetlands. That's something that would be allowed on their zoning with a permit uh, issued by uh, a subdivision approved by the yeah. planning commission. There's also a provision in the town's bylaws that allows for a more dense develop, development um, under the uh, authority of the North Reading Housing Authority. That could be between 18 and 21 units. Again, it would require a permitting process as well. 
Um, the maximum build out scenario um, is more development proposal. Um, I do not believe that the property right now is zoned to account for this, so it would need to be rezoned. But there's a belief that the property itself could could absorb 81 to two bedroom unit unit apartments or condominiums uh, uh, as long as the septic system was under 10,000 gallons a day. Um, that's all under you know, existing zoning with the exception of the last example that I provided um, for the property. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. So not acquiring it leaves it you know, available for other development, which again, isn't as, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, it would have to be permitted and, and or by right, what was available by right under our zoning. All right, so. Um, with, with the, with the, um, the zoning plan that uh, the gentleman spoke about uh, be available on the website so I could observe it where, where, the, um, where the five uh, building lots would be? Um, no, I don't, I don't, I think that that would be, that is a potential development option for a purchaser of the lot that's not the town. So it's, it, when we're talking about, what we're talking about is the town's right to purchase this came up because its use as a turkey farm is going to be changed by the potential purchaser. And that's how this scenario came about. It's no longer going to be used as a farm. So under the law, the town has the right of first refusal to acquire it. So, but what we're talking about is if we don't acquire it, if the town does not go forward and acquire it, um, then any potential uh, bona fide purchase or any potential buyer could acquire it and develop it. And there's already existing zoning that any potential buyer could develop it under existing zoning or through permitting process. So there isn't a plan in mind for that. We're just saying what could go in right now under the existing zoning. Does that answer your question? Well, it, I guess it answered my questions, but I guess the question is still lingering is, is uh, you know, isn't it, is it appropriate for the town to, to get together and say, you know, we're, we're going to spend this money for it, um, the town's money, and the reason we're doing it is because we're, it's an opportunity to acquire land inexpensively, but we want to we want to acquire it. We want to increase the tax base, and, and we think we can put so much so many properties there, and and you know have the survey done like you've already done there with a with 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 the water survey, and and find out how many units you can put on that, so the so the so the residents would know would know what the what what the plan is because if you're going to vote yes or vote no, it might make a difference, and it would. Would allow the town to get another yes rather than rather than another no. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if there's anybody that wants uh, to to add um, add to that discussion. I know that. Um, we haven't made a definitive, and I think that's for, for a later point, to make a definitive plan with regard to the use of it, but the opportunity to acquire it is only available to us for a very limited window of time. And that's why we're, we're moving forward with the special town meeting on acquisition. Even though it was delayed due to COVID, we only have a specific window of time to de make a determination on acquisition. We, we have a longer period of time. I don't think we can answer your question, um, Mr. De Niro, on what the use is, because there's a number of different potential uses for it. I don't think you, we can answer you to that um, this evening, what the intended use of it is, because that hasn't been determined. I think what um, what we can indicate is that at least a majority of us are in favor of acquisition of it 
because of its potential for development or potential for other use for the town. But I, I don't think we're going to be able to answer you what, what we would intend to use uh, to use it for yet because we haven't made that decision. And that would actually have to be through, through town um, involvement what it's going to be used for. Okay. How it's going to be okay. Thank you very much. That was that's that's my concern, and, and uh, just thank you for giving me the opportunity to to uh, put that forward. Yeah, I appreciate. We we all appreciate your participating in this. All right, Douglas Is, Tenney. Yes, Mr. Yeah. Tenney. Thank you, Douglas Tenney, Twelve Angel Road. Uh, one question I have is, I mean, if we don't, per or the one thing I would like to bring up, if we don't purchase this property now, is we could find ourselves in a similar situation as with the, the uh, property by the, the uh, Thompson Country Club, where um, an owner comes in and files a, uh, a, a high density zoning requ request, whereas if we own the property, then at least puts a limit on that likelihood. Is that correct or incorrect? The potential for an individual to come in and propose a 40B development yes. exists. So, the so yes, that's a very legitimate consideration. And as everyone's considerations that have been raised are for and against. But yes, of course, a developer could come in, acquire, and then propose that kind of a um, project for that. And so then the town would be spending, have an expenditure in trying to fight such an, such an introduction as opposed to just acquiring the property outright in front. That's also a potential if the town was opposed to that kind of a development in that location. That's, that's, that's also a potential. Um, so Mr. Tenney, would, can I take from your comment to mean that you'd be in favor of an acquisition by the town? Yes. <laughs> okay. That's a good point. Thank you for uh, participating. Thank you for your comments. And do you have any other comments or questions? Not at this time. Madam Chair, I see a hand up. Uh, Timothy okay. Sutherland. And to my colleagues, I'd, um, if there's anything you want to jump in and, and speak about, I know Mrs. Gonzalez actually raised that. Um, in, when we were, when I pulled the members, I think every single one of us has different views on it and different, you know, thoughts about why acquisition is important. And I know Mrs. Gonzalez raised that as one of those as well. So we have another individual that like would like to speak. If you Hi, could Tim, just Tim state Sutherland, your name and your address. Tim Sutherland, 17 Maple Road. Go ahead, Mrs. Sutherland. I have more of a question. If the, if the town uh, opts to buy the property, should it choose to sell to a developer in the future? Would that be a warrant at a future town meeting or can the town sell it unilaterally? Mr. Colberto. Madam Chair, through you, um, the articles are written to authorize the acquisition of the park property, appropriation of funds to acquire the property as well in the amounts that I described earlier and would also authorize conveyance of the parcels in the future as well. Um, any development would be required to occur consistent with zoning. So if we're talking about a development that was not consistent with zoning, town meeting action would be required at that point in time. So essentially your answer is yes. Right, Mr. Gilberto? Yes, so the, yes, so the authorization would allow the select board to convey the property in the future, but the development would be subject to zoning. It's a very broadly broadly um, worded so, authorization. So to be clear, that means that outside of the, the larger option, the town could elect to do a larger 18 to 21 unit development without input from the town. Under the existing zoning bylaw and through the permitting process, yes, that is a possibility, as I understand it. But it would have to be in conjunction with the housing authority or some other Correct. type of So It would have to be in conjunction with the housing authority. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, any, 
Anyone else attending that would like to co ask comment, uh, provide comments or questions or input? I see a uh, hand up, Gail Tenney. Yeah, Gail Tenney, 12 Angel Road. Um, I had a question. Is there any uh, schedule for if we, we did purchase the land to determine what it would be used for? So we purchased land before off of Elm Street, and I believe it's still sitting there with nothing being done. So is there any timeline that a decision would be made if we did um, get the pr property? Mr. Gilberto. There, there hasn't been discussion of a timeline for potential uh, use or, or development. Um, as the chair indicated earlier, I think that the, the thinking is that there's an opportunity to acquire right now um, and that uh, the options are, are, are pretty wide, but that uh, we're not in a position at the moment to make a determination about the, the best use moving forward, um, at least at this time. But the board members could certainly share their individual thoughts if uh, they wish. Any of my colleagues wish to provide any input? I don't think so. Yeah, I, no, I, no, that's fine. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think we have a we have a lot of different options and potential and a lot of different um, ideas collectively as a board. We have varied ideas with regard to what the land should be used for. But the reason for us moving forward is we have a limited window of time to acquire it, and once that time evaporates it it's anyone's game after that so that was well, that's really why we're moving forward with it and i think what mr o'leary expressed is that it's a you know prime piece of property in a beautiful location and it is now available and we do have funds that are designated for this acquisition purpose to be able to acquire it. And Madam Chair, if I might. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, yeah. um, I'm not overly concerned about a, a time schedule. Maybe some people are as to, you know, what determination should be made as to what, what use it should be. I don't think we have our back against the wall on it. <clears throat> and I'm not so sure, we, so sure we know if we acquire it, what its best use and purpose would be without thinking forward as to really what do we see for, <laughs> see for development and needs, you know, whether it be open space, whether it be a transportation center, whether it be affordable housing, whether it be a combination of two or three things, whether we rezone a commercial industrial because uh, you know sewage is coming in the not too distant future. Um, but what I do know is that if we don't purchase it, uh, whatever the determination is gonna be is out of our hands and out of our control. All we can do is react to a permitting application or a zoning uh, change application, as opposed to you know, giving it a good measured approach in relation to really what do we think is, is best suited, uh, this property is best suited for. And again, if it's gonna be a zoning change, town meeting is gonna have to weigh in. Uh, if there's gonna be a request for proposals out there, it's gonna be subject to public hearings and all the rest through the board process in the hearings process and the applications process. So everything's gonna be done, you know, uh, be open. Uh, but again, as far as the timeline, no. The only time that we're up against here is we had 120 days to make a determination as to whether we wanted to buy it or not. And, um, you know, that was pushed out because of the COVID situation. We should have been determining this back in May. Uh, so to me, that's the only determination. Is it a value to the town to regain or take control of this particular parcel and have its destiny be in our control rather than uh, just um, a reaction to a permitting process from another applicant. So the long answer was that. The short answer is no, there's no timeline. <laughs> Can I Can make a note, add, Chair? Add to that. Oh, Mr. Studo. Um, and again, I think it was uh, Mr. Douglas Tenney that brought up the point about, you know, and I think Mr. O'Leary also touched on it, but I think what happened Right now is what I meant about, you know, it, it is my understanding that there was an opportunity for the town to buy 
20 Elm. And now the town is paying the price. And again, it's something where hindsight is 2020, but this could easily become that. Because actually, I, I feel like there's even more room than even 20 Elm. And again, I'm not, uh, don't quote me on that. So I think that that reason alone, I think is a, people should consider that. I mean, just, just by last year, seeing what happened on another piece of property the town could have owned that many back then thought was not worth it. So I just think that that alone should be a very strong, you know, just kind of determinant when you're thinking about this, that sometimes, you know, the end goal can be something as simple as holding on to land so someone else doesn't do something you don't want, rather than, as Mr. Larry said, kind of set a deadline on what to put on it. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Studo. And if I can just add to actually what Mr. G what Mr. Gannon mentioned in utilizing that RFP process, that's actually what the board did and the town did with the JT Berry parcel. And we got varied uh, responses to the RFP, throwing it out there with the possibility that, you know, we might be doing zoning changes if it's a good enough proposal. We're not there yet, but we do have the ability, like, Mr. Gannon said to utilize the RFP process to see just what the appetite is there for development and working, either working with the developer, working with a nonprofit, working with a for-profit um, to develop the parcel or, uh, you know, that we would be able to have the ability to see what, what's out there for proposals and also have the ability to accept or reject um, any of the, any and all of them, uh, not accept all of them, but accept the best one and reject all of them if we had to and go out and do it again. So very similar to what we did with the JP Berry parcel. And that is by virtue of what we accepted, the reason why we have, we actually have funds set aside for this, this type of a, an acquisition. So um, that I hope that Mrs. Tenney, do you have any other questions on that? Does that answer your questions? And do you have any other input that you wanted to give on that? Muted. Yeah, no, that's that's fine. You know, just that we did have that other property that we purchased several years ago, spent a lot of money on, and there's not even access. So that was my only concern. I've got one follow-up question. I'd like to ask about the about taxes. Is that is this you, Mr. De Niro? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. Mr. De Niro. Yeah, my 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 question is, I guess if you're buying something, the town is buying something, you're 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 buying it uh, for a future income stream. So basically uh, you're 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 buying it in, in, in order to 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 build future tax base or revenues. So my question is, if the electric company, I forget his name. Coviello. Coviello. If, if, if his company purchased the land and it brings another business in town and, and you know, there's, there's not a lot of business in North Reading, um, how much does that add to the, to the tax base of the town? And, and what would be the, what would be the tax base of the town if the town bought it and sold it to a developer? And let's say you develop five lots on it. I don't know what the number of lots would be if the town bought it and sold it, but what, what do you perceive, um, you know, best guess, I guess, because you haven't done any, any planning on it. Um, what, what would be the difference in a tax base if the town bought it? and sold it versus Coviello on putting his business on it. I'm not sure that we could take a try at an answer. Um, so right now it's taxed as farmland. So Mr. Gilberto, do you have, do you happen to have that figure, the figure for the assessment? I think it's 22,000 or? Madam Shea, it's, uh... <clears throat> I believe it's currently valued at two hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars. I can confirm that while we're going through this. Um, we don't have a you know pro forma or the details of a specific 
um, residential development proposal um, to be able to compare to. Um, similarly, there, you know, the, the, the value if developed for an industrial or other purpose would depend upon the nature of the specific development and what uh, what were to go in there, um, you know, through the, the approval process. So I, I think it's difficult for us to to quantify that. I, I think I can, you know, generally answer it by saying that we often hear when we go out for market analysis for town-owned land, including with the Volte property, that the the highest and best use is also is often flagged as residential use for property here in uh, in North Reading, um, and that's obviously a reflection of our um, you know our neighborhoods and, and residential home values. But that's more of a general statement than it is a specific one related to a specific property or this specific property. I think that's probably the best I can give you for an answer at this point in time. I will uh, check back in in a moment to give you the number on the value to confirm okay. that. Okay. And the asset current as current tax is assessed. M Mr. Walner. Just to, just to be sure I'm, I understand it too, the property is zoned residential. And if Caviello was to try to bring his business into it, he would have to get a zoning change, which the town would have to approve. So even if his intent is to create a commercial space, he cannot do that unless we give a permit to do that. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Genera, does that answer your question? I don't think we can give you, um, <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna be able to answer specific money, specific money it, amounts for you. Can, maybe, I, maybe I can put it in perspective, Madam Chair, a little bit. If, uh, let's just say that uh, Mr. Caviello or anybody else, a developer comes in here and you know, buys it for a million bucks, uh, it's going to go commercial, industrial, goes to town meeting and is successful at having a zoning change put in. And whatever they build there is worth $5 million. That brings in about $80,000 in tax revenue to the town. So a $5 million development on that property will give you about $80,000 in, in tax revenue. You know, then it's just a question of is town meeting willing to rezone it? You know, and again, if you, if you, if you put in, um, five house lots, five homes at um, 750,000, I'd say a million dollars. Again, that's 5 million bucks, five house, five house lots and each house sells for a million dollars. The tax rate's the same. It's gonna bring in about, you know, 80,000, 80 to $85,000 a year in tax revenue. The difference being though, is it's currently zoned residential. And if single family homes go in there, we all know, as a matter of fact, the single family homes are really a loser for the community in relation to tax revenue. You know, if they have a couple of kids, it's 15,000 bucks a piece to educate your kids. You know, and that doesn't account for police, fire, DPW, and all the other services that we provide. So single family homes, single family uh, dwellings cost the town more money than they bring in in revenue. Uh, commercial industrial properties, a little bit different. The need for services are different. They don't put kids in the school system. Again, that's more than two thirds of our budget is, is the school system. So uh, what do we wanna see happen there? You know, um, Do we wanna partner with somebody and determine exactly what's gonna happen there or do as the town grows down the road? And I, and I understand that uh, Mrs. Tenney, I think it was brought up, you know, we bought some land off of Elm Street um, and haven't done anything with it. We've also bought, purchased, uh, and again, we've had members of the finance committee mention that we purchased stuff for Ipswich River Pond Park and we haven't done anything with it. You know that property we had specific ideas for it. We don't have to develop it yet, but we know what it's for, it's for passive recreation. The other property, we haven't got a use for it yet, but we know what was going to go in there. That was, that was a 40B proposal that was gonna happen there. Uh, and we took a, we made a, a strong judgment that we didn't wanna see that happen in that particular location at this particular time when it happened and the town stepped forward and purchased it and now it's in our own control. So again, many times we, we make the investment in in property, not just for future economic development and not just to increase our revenue stream, as was indicated maybe by Mr. I think it was Mr. Denaro, um, but to protect our interests and to provide for open space or provide for different municipal uses that we have seen or unforeseen. Uh, as we have on Mill Street, we purchased some property on Mill Street, you know, because we're gonna have sewers coming in through the town of Reading. We, 
signed the long-term deal with Andover. We're in the process of putting a request for proposal. I'm gonna be selling off a portion of what we bought on Mill Street and holding a portion of that land because we see there's a significant, uh, it's location-wise is significant, but we don't have a municipal purpose for it yet. But it would be unwise to forfeit it and give it up. So again, there's a whole host of things that come in here. It's not all economically driven. It's, you know, what's our future gonna be? What's the known and what's the unknown? And how can we protect ourselves and give ourselves uh, and future boards and town meetings the opportunity to make some informed decisions and have some options. So uh, again, from an economic standpoint, what does it mean for development? 5 million bucks, 80 to $85,000 a year, whether it be residential or whether it be commercial. Mr. Gilberto. Just to follow up, Madam Chair, uh, the last known sale price for the property was $270,000. It's assessed valuation is $97,500 right now. $94,100 of that is in the um, buildings and $3,400 of that is in land, reflective of the reduction associated with the uh, restriction for the agricultural use on the property. From our own assessor's rec records, the, the initial market land value is identified as $457,800. That's if it were not restricted. And that's just you know an initial number without further delving into the value of the property. Mr. Denaro, any other questions? No, I, I think I, I think I, I think that was my my last question. Uh, I think Mr. O'Leary kind of made 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 the case for selling to, to Mr. Copiello because it brings in the same amount of money, and 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 the, the town doesn't have to absorb the additional cost of services for families, um, you know, and and so I, I guess. I guess my 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 summation for me personally, I guess, um, being selfish again, is is that you know my my um, interest as a town is is going to buy the property to to uh, save the town money and and bring in more revenue from the town and keep taxes down for all, all residents. Madam Madam Chair, just to, just oh, to, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, so Mr. Denaro, Denaro, you know, whether it be Mr. Caviello or any other uh, future developer, and, and again, Mr. Caviello, I have the highest regard for. He's an active member of the community for a number of years and volunteering and um, you know, just a, an outstanding individual whose uh, character is um, not being called to question at all. In other words, if I had to partner with a developer, he'd be one of the people I'd be more than interested in, in talking to because uh, you know, he says what he means, he means what he says, and, he's, and he has the town's best interest at, at heart. Uh, but that being said, you know, I, I, am I sure that you know what's being proposed there, or what he was originally proposed to, to doing, you know, really the best use of that property uh, from a, a townwide standpoint, is that really what we want to see right now? You know, and uh, we could still partner with somebody like a Mr. Caviello but we would be in control as to what type of businesses would go there, what type of development, uh, the density of it, um, and how it's gonna be laid out through a request for proposal uh, type process. So again, it's just an opportunity for us um, based upon the state law that provides the town to take control of the situation rather than just uh, reacting to um, a special, you know, a, a town meeting warrant article, which just requires 10 signatures, you know, for a rezoning or uh, a type of proposal that uh, Mr. Calviello or anybody else might put forward, whether it be for commercial industrial, or whether it be for a 40B, or whether it be for uh, some uh, sort of a community housing in conjunction with the housing authority. You know, why not take control of the situation now? Um, again, I don't see it from an economic standpoint as being a loser for the community at all, because this is the fair market value of it as it stands right now. Um, and again, if sewage comes down the, the road, as I anticipate it's going to in the next decade or so, you know, the value of the property increases substantially um, and maybe that's when the town, town wants to take some action too. So, uh, so yes, maybe I did support the argument for commercial industrial development because it doesn't put kids in the school system. Uh, but then again, you know, housing needs are uh, substantial too and we have an obligation to meet them. So, but future boards and future town meetings will make those determinations and I think we should provide ourselves the option. 
Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. And I think it's important to note that this came to, again, it came to our attention because there is a bona fide purchase and sale agreement between Mr. Coviello and uh, the sellers, the Magliozis. That doesn't bind Mr. Coviello to only putting an industrial use in there if he gets permitting for it. it he could develop it as a residential uh, development uh, or whatever he's allowed to do under the zoning or whatever he's allowed to do under permitting. Um, do you do is that are you all set Mr. Denaro? Oh, yes, thank you very much for for hearing me. No, thank you for participating and we have a few hands raised. Mrs. Tenney, do you have any other questions or comments? Your hand is still raised. No, okay, thank you. All right, we have Andy. Can you please identify yourself for the uh, Yep, Andy ask. Schultz, 4 Central Street, North Reading. You guys look very good up there. A um, couple of things, uh, just watching the hearing, and, and I was on the board when this first came to light. Um, first of all, I think Mr. Coviello is a serious businessman, and I think it sounds like the town has an interest in this particular property, but I think the town should do everything it can to find him a suitable place for his business because he's, a, as Mr. O'Leary just stated, he's a very upstanding man in the community. He's volunteered his time on a lot of different boards, and I think it behooves us as a town to find him a home for his business. As far as this parcel is concerned, um, I was for the purchase of it. I look at it as a potential place for senior housing. Uh, I know we had talked about the area off of Carpenter Drive in the past, but if you can have a parcel like this that you're gonna eventually have sewer, and I would say five to seven years or so if it gets pushed, um, I think it's gonna be a lot cheaper to build some kind of a significant housing project if you have a wastewater solution than if you're dealing with septic. Um, and also being so close to the river, it's obviously much more environmentally friendly if there's a, uh, a sewer system there. We're not leaching towards the river and the watershed. So I think it's very important that the town looks at this as a kind of a land deal, as a number of the members have pointed out tonight, and I think correctly so. I don't see the town losing money on this down the road. I think it might have been Mr. O'Leary who just said you're, you're paying fair market value, value for it. Um, it could be sold off if you wanted to sell it off. But I think it's a parcel big enough that you can put something of significance on there. And again, we can't lose sight of the fact that if you can tie into a sewer system, you can build something much more substantial. Just look at 28 right now. The lack of a wastewater solution limits what we can build. And I think this is something that we really want to buy for the long term. And I don't think you have to decide right away what you want to do with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. We also have Paul. B with his hand up. Hi, um, this is actually Marcy B, Marcy Bailey. Um, Hello, Marcy Bailey. Hi everyone, I hope everyone's well. Um, I just wanted to weigh in and agree with Mr. O'Leary and Mr. Schultz. I do think that the town should acquire this property, have it under its, um, our control and determine the best use for, for the town overall. I do have a question though. I was wondering whether this property was looked at at all, even though the town doesn't own it as part of the housing production plan or has been looked at in light of the housing production plan since it's become available for our consideration. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't believe that this site was flagged as an identified location for um, development at the time the plan was uh, was developed, uh, which would now be two plus years ago. Um, but in the course of the discussion over the past six months, I think that the use for housing for seniors and I think of affordable housing for seniors has been something that's been discussed and been in consideration. So, uh, you know, it may be a reflection of the timing that uh, the property kind of came came up as an option after the plan was identified. So I do think that that's something that, you know, that is in consideration along with other, um, you know, other potential development proposals or not developing the property at all and you know, leaving it in its uh, you know, current or, or, or similar condition. Mr. Schultz. Uh, I, I know uh, uh, planner is, is online. I don't know if Danielle can weigh in a little bit as what the, what the planning commission has discussed or hasn't discussed the date because I haven't heard either, you know. 
The Planning Commission hasn't taken um, a, a formal position on whether to support the article, um, but in, in, in some recent meetings when this has come up, uh, the members have expressed their support for the town acquiring the property, um, although no vote has been taken. Um, some ideas for possible uses or just to conserve it as open space um, have, have been ideas that have been floated. Um, but no, it was not looked at as part of the housing production plan, though affordable housing and senior housing have been some possibilities that have been mentioned. So this, this wasn't available when that plan was created. So it could not possibly have been considered. That's correct. Do you have any other, uh, thank you, Mrs. McKnight. Mrs. Bailey, do you have any other questions or input? No, I do not. Thank you. Okay, thank you for participating. Mrs. Gonzalez. Just on, on that note um, for Mrs. Bailey, the, um, as a member of the Housing Authority, we did send a letter in, of recommendation. Um, it's something that we'd be interested in and talked about. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. All right, we have, um, we still have a number of people. Uh, I can see Andy and um, Marcy's hand raised, but I know you're all finished with your comment. Does anyone else who's attending want to comment or qu ask questions? If you could just state your name and address. I don't see any other hands raised either. <clears throat> Me neither. Okay, let me just check the chat room. Oh, okay. I see Mr. Kaufman. Oh, withdrawn. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay, seeing no, uh, we still have the next article to move <laughs> on to. So, the, uh, Madam Chair, I, I know that um, Mr. Carviello made a, uh, another proposal for the board's consideration um, in relation to in whatever new facility he were to build there would provide some recreational space. And I think it's important for the public to understand. And again, if Mr. Caviello is willing to share his, his opinion as to what his plans are, or, or Mr. Dimitri, who represented both parties here, you know, what, what the proposed plan is so that the public can be well aware as to a choice. Do you want to buy it or do you want to allow something like to, to, allow this to happen. I think that's important if they're willing to share it now. You know, if they're not, that's fine too. But I know that uh, at one public meeting, they did offer uh, some recreational space in conjunction with the concept they had of, of relocating his business there, which again would require a zoning change. But if they're willing to offer that up in this public hearing forum, I think that's important for the public to, to hear also, if they're interested. Okay. Well, I think we need to move on to a discussion of the next article. Well, that would be under, this is the turkey farm. So right, right. If, they, if they wish to. It, it, yeah. uh, it's to acquire, if it's whether or not the town should acquire the turkey farm. So. Right. And the public should know, and I would expect that if they don't, no one to share it now, they're gonna share it on Saturday as to what the plan is, because the, one of the questions that's gonna be asked is, hasn't been outright asked yet is, you know, what is the proposal? You know, what what is Mr. Caviello planning on doing there? What would he like to do or see done? And, you know, let the public know. Um, I do see Mr. Dimitri and I do see Mr. You're obviously under no obligation to discuss this, but if, you, if you'd like to share that, either one of you, I think, I see Sergio, which I think might be Mr. Caviello. Yeah. You don't have to, but if you if you would like to share what the potential development is there that you're planning, if the town doesn't move forward with it. No, okay. All right. Okay, I don't see or hear from them, so we can move on to article um, two. 
Madam Chair, I'm just going to mute, I'm going to mute folks just for a minute while I go through the presentation. Then I Thank will unmute. You. Okay, Madam Chair, can everyone see my screen? Great. Article two is related to the acquisition, appropriation, and conveyance associated with four and 12 Concord Street. The request of town meeting is for authorization to acquire the properties and to appropriate $980,000 in the proceeds of the sale of town owned land for the purchase as well as to demolish buildings on the properties. Demolition and relocation costs are estimated to cost $80,000 and the proposed sale price between the owner and buyer is $450,000 for each property. We have modeled this based upon that, although we are not a party to that agreement at this point in time. Two thirds of the voters present are required to approve. And similarly, as we stated in the title, we would be seeking from town meeting, not only the ability to acquire, but for the select board to convey the property in the future. A little bit about the properties. They have common ownership with 14 Concord Street, the poultry farm property that we just discussed. Four Concord Street is a 0.92 acre parcel with a single family home in the market attached to the back. 12 Concord Street is a 0.92 acre parcel with a two family home and a large V shaped barn to the rear of the property. And I've just got a map in here um, that's from the warrant that was mailed to our residents' homes. Uh, both are zoned residence A, as uh, is the poultry farm property itself. This is a, a better view of the parcel commonly known as 4 Concord Street. You can see this is Concord Street here. This is the home with the market attached to the back and the driveway that is vis visible from Concord Street. You're not sharing a presentation. Uh, Mr. Gilberto, we're not seeing, I'm not seeing anything other than the special town meeting informational virtual oh. warrant. Okay. Thank you. Let's see if we can fix that. There you go. I'm gonna scroll back. So this is the first image I was referring to. Can everyone see here a, uh, a map with um, the two smaller parcels outlined in bold? Yes? Yes. Okay. Let's see if I can blow this up. And then uh, this is the four Concord Street parcel with Concord Street here. Can everybody see Concord Street? Yep. As well as the home and the uh, market attached to the back with the driveway that goes to the rear of the property that is visible from Concord Street. And this is the next door parcel, number 12 Concord Street. The two family home is in the front and the large V-shaped barn is uh, to the rear of that property. You can see that the, uh, this driveway that I referenced earlier sort of traverses both parcels. <coughs> A little bit about why these two properties are on the warrant. Number 12 Concord Street, the owner has entered into a purchase and sale agreement for 12 Concord Street, which is that two family home and home in the V-shaped barn. It's conditioned on the buyer purchasing 14 Concord Street. Number four Concord Street, the owner has also entered into an option agreement contingent upon the buyer purchasing 14 Concord Street for four Concord Street, the single family home and market, requiring the owner to offer four Concord Street to the buyer if he chooses to sell that property in the next three years. The town does not have an option to purchase these properties at this time, but based on the wording of the agreements in place with the buyer, the properties may be available to the town if the town purchases 14 Concord Street. Accordingly, the select board is seeking authority to potentially acquire these properties based on the conditions outlined in the, in the agreements between the owner and the buyer um, but subject to further negotiation at a later point in time. And Madam Chair, that really concludes the presentation on Article 2.
Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Um, and that the authorization um, is for the sum of $980,000, as you explained. Correct. Um, and that's based upon our understanding of what the two parcels are being uh, potentially sold to Mr. Sergio, Sir, uh, Mr. Coviello in connection with the acquisition of the turkey farm. That's correct. Okay, so do we have, do any of the, my colleagues have any more input that they'd like to add with respect to article two? All right, seeing none, we'll take, let's open it up to members of the public attending for any questions, concerns, or comments. I will unmute everybody, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. If you'd like to speak with regard to Article 2, please just state your name and your address. Mr. Gannon. Thank you. Again, Jeff Gannon, 3 Linwood Avenue. Um, I would say that if the town does vote to purchase the larger parcel, Article 1, it would make sense to purchase or have the ability to possibly purchase these two um, because my assumption is, and this is my question is, um, has there been any thought or what is the ability to combine the three adjacent lots that are in question in article one and two and uh, consider that in terms of future plans for, for the town? Thank you. Madam Chair, through you, uh, so I, I believe that that is the thinking um, in, in having this uh, warrant article on to acquire the uh, other two properties at number four and 12 Concord Street, should they be available to the town. Um, again, it's not something that we are a party to at this point. Uh, the nuance of the, the law is that we do have a right to step into the buyer's shoes for 14 Concord Street because of that restriction uh, for agricultural use, resulting in reduced uh, property tax obligations for the parcel. Um, that's not the case for number four and number 12. Um, but again, by the, the seller, when they notified us that they were intending to sell the property to um, the prospective buyer, they were required to give us the copies of purchase and sale agreements for the abutting parcels, including which were these two parcels. So that's how we know the terms and conditions that were outlined for that, those potential transactions. Um, but we're not in a position to negotiate uh, at this point in time with regard to those transactions. We believe we could be in the event that we uh, actually pursue the acquisition of 14 Concord Street. So this warrant has been structured to allow the town to proceed in the fashion you've described. We just, we, we, there's a bit of a, a, a sequence that has to be followed before we get to that point. Any other questions, Mr. Gannon? Uh, I'm not, maybe my question wasn't clear enough, but the, the question would be if the town has an intent to possibly purchase this, which it seems like it does if it's available, um, I guess, is there support from this board? We haven't really taken that poll yet. Uh, but if so, is there any thought from anyone that these parcels could be combined or subdivided uh, after the fact? And again, I understand this is an if, but that's what I'm curious about is what that thought uh, might be, if there is a thought. Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, yes, I, and I believe the board members will speak for themselves. I believe there's a majority of the board that believes that it's important for us to uh, uh, to have the ability to purchase, uh, enter, to, enter negotiations to purchase these other two properties along with the turkey farm. Um, again, you're talking about 113 feet for, worth of front, frontage uh, for the turkey farm. And in total with the three, you've got over 500 feet of frontage. Um, so I think it would be the intent of the majority of the board, if we could successfully negotiate with the, uh, with the owner to purchase all three, it would then become you know, primarily one unit for consideration. And again, depending upon what the town decides to do down the road, certainly acquiring these other two parcels enhances the value and potential uses of the property uh, substantially with these two parcels up front. You know, as far as the frontage and the depth of these two, they're about an acre apiece, um, but right on right on Concord Street. 
substantially enhances the uh, potential uses going forward rather than having them remain as separate developable lots. So it, it would seem to make sense if we're going to, to do it, do it all at once, take control of the entire parcels, say all three parcels, um, square it off and decide later on what we want to do with it. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Any other follow-up, Mr. Gannon? No, thank you. All right. Anybody <clears throat> else that wishes to comment, quest ask questions, provide input? <clears throat> I'm seeing none, seeing none in the chat. I've unmuted everybody again, not hearing anybody. Okay. Okay. So article, the next article, the operating budget. Madam Chair, through you, Article 3 would amend the fiscal year 2020 operating budget. As I mentioned at the beginning, this article was placed on the warrant when we were anticipating that the meeting would occur on May 11th. And so we were looking to request action on a financial matter prior to the June annual town meeting. This meeting has obviously been delayed beyond the end of the fiscal year and beyond the June annual town meeting. And the action that was required on May 11th was actually taking, taken on June 29th. And so we are therefore not expecting any action to be requested um, and would be recommending that the board move to pass over the article on the floor of town meeting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. So it's really no, we're, there's really nothing to address with respect to article three. But if anyone has any questions, I suppose <laughs> it is an informational hearing and informational meeting. Does anybody participating have any questions or comments or input? I'm seeing none. All right. Okay. So that if there's no other comment or discussion, I think that will that concludes the informational hearing. Okay. And thank you uh, for everyone for your patience and participating. And hopefully we still have an opportunity if there's any further questions um, to, to submit them and we'll try to get the answer to them. And of course, we, we do encourage in your attendance in person at the town meeting this Saturday, August 8th at the Arthur Kenny Field. Um, they did a wonderful graduation ceremony, so that we have a sort of a benchmark to go by in terms of distancing and, and uh, speeches and talking and everything else like that. So hopefully we will see you at the August 8th town I think, meeting. I, th I think the weather's going to weather's gonna be good, too, it looks like. So yeah, for us, lucky for us so far. I hope so. Yeah. No rain dances out there. Okay, thank you. For, thanks for joining us on that portion. So we're going to move on to the next order of business. Are you going to, Madam Chair, are we going to be making a recommendation on these articles tonight? Let me just take a quick look at the. Do we have votes in the packet? We do, Madam Chair. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> I think we, <laughs> we've talked about it enough as a board, but if there's anything else, and then do I have a motion? If there's anything else the members won't, would like to discuss on this, otherwise, do I have a motion? Yes. Um, <laughs> Madam, <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to recommend a town meeting, Article 1, 14 Concord Street. Just move to recommend Article One. You don't have to say at town meeting because at town meetings we're going to do this. So just okay. move to Thank recommend you. Article One. Yep. Sorry, move to recommend Article One. All right. I'll second that. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? 
And I'll note that our members of our finance committee, Mrs. Hurlbut and Mr. Kelleher have been joining us and they're, uh, they are meeting on Wednesday to take a formal vote. So at this point, we don't have, as a board, we don't have their indication in favor, in favor or against until they take a vote on Wednesday. Um, but any further discussion by the members? Seeing none, motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. No. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manupelli is aye. So we'll recommend, we'll recommend uh, Article 1 at town meeting. Well, we just voted to recommend it at town meeting. Do I have another motion? Yes. Madam Chair, I move to recommend Article 2, 4 and 12 Concord Street. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. No. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manupelli is no. So we vote, majority vote to recommend Article 2. And we're going to probably have a motion to pass over Article 3 in the packet to Mr. Studo. Yes. Madam Chair, I move to pass over Article 3 FY 2020 budget. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. So we're passed, we'll recommend pass over Article 3. Okay. So that concludes our informational hearing and our recommendations. Thank you folks for joining us. We're going to move on with the next order of business. And we did kind of skip around a little, a little bit. Um, yes, Mr. Gilberto. Do you wish to determine um, the assignment of Warren articles for town meeting this evening? Or will you, you want to provide them in the morning at town meeting? Um, we can decide it now if, the, if my colleagues would like to decide it. And it, does anyone have a preference on presentation of these articles? There's only two of them. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. I'm happy to present them. Um, if there's anyone that feels strongly, and we can all, of course, we all have the opportunity to, to come to the podium too if, if, we're given, if we're granted permission to speak by Mr. Murphy with regard to where we stand on these. I feel confident to let you present them, Madam Chair. Yeah. Right. I'm certainly available if you want to uh, to bow out. Let's do. Let's do. Uh, how about Article One? I'll handle. And how about you handle Article Two, Mr. O'Leary? Does that, that work for, for that you? That works. Thank you. All right. And Article Three is where I can do Article Three, <laughs> unless it's Mr. Studo wants to go up and <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm fine thank you okay are we all set with that then and uh madam chair we did uh there were two motions to approve minutes yes Wednesday. yes i i should have asked my colleagues permission to skip over that i was trying to expedite reaching this this public this informational hearing so go ahead mr studer do i have a motion mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I move to approve the July 20, 2020 regular session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing Mr. Walner. Just very briefly, just uh, Jane on uh, page 10 of the meeting notes, which is page 17 in our packet. At the very bottom, Mr. Hertz's name is used twice. Um, and I, I wasn't referencing him on the second uh, reference. That's
that is actually the committee that Leanne was working with, which is the uh, that recreational open space committee. So if you could just substitute, we don't have to change, you know, we don't have to stop approving the minutes, just change that wording. That would be accurate to what was said. That's it. Okay, so, um, so motion to amend with regard to Mr. Walner's change. Motion to approve as amended by Mr. Walner. Do I hear a motion to approve as amended by Mr. Walner? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Sure a second. Motion to approve as amended uh, by Mr. Studo, seconded by Mr. <laughs> O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I move to approve the July 20, 2020 executive session minutes as written. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, seconded by Mr. O'Leary. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. Just for the edification of the members, there was uh, an area in those minutes that was highlighted in yellow. Um, the only reason it was highlighted is because it, it was something that the uh, that Jane had asked me to just double check. And normally once I do that, I remove the highlight and I, uh, I failed to do so on Thursday when I was finishing that. So, so if that confused it, if that caused any confusion, I apologize for that. Uh, but they are, they are in our opinion, ready for approval. I thought those comments were worth highlighting myself. <laughs> they were yours, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And we won't get into a discussion of it until we vote to release them, however. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, Mr. O'Leary. So, I had a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Minnie Pelly is aye. All right. Our next order of business is to, we're up to number 13 on the agenda, approve order of taking for the water chlorination facility at 303 Main Street, vote to approve and authorize the chair to sign. Madam Chair, through you, um, I know that this has been on the agenda a number of times, and uh, I want to thank um, Mr. Dimitri for you know his uh, his efforts working with us. Um, he's been you know very much cooperative through the uh, end phases of the process and with the transition in the public works department. We uh, ran into a stumbling block of just getting the plan uh, modified only slightly, and uh, we do have it uh, modified. And um, I added into the packet later this afternoon a signed copy of the um, waiver of the appraisal uh, and um, that was signed by Mr. Um, by Mr. Dimitri, which now puts us in a position of the board being able to vote to approve the order of taking and to authorize the chair um, to sign um, the order as well. The, um, just for the edification of the, um, of the public, this would be a location at which we would be constructing a water rechlorination facility to uh, add chlorine to water coming into town um, along Main Street from the town of Andover. Um, the consideration would be the payment of a sum of $131,250, as well as some um, restoration and improvements to the parking lot at the property, namely finished paving and crack sealing the construction trench, um, crack sealing and seal coating the entire parking lot, and repainting the lines and markings uh, on the parking lot surface, um, which would again restore it to a complete uh, status. Um, we have gone out to bid for the construction that would take place at this location, and we do have bids in, and we're reviewing them now um, through that process. So we know very much is timely, um, and again, all of this work is funded through a um, an appropriation, including state mass work grant funding, not to exceed. Six million dollars, um, as approved in the October 2018 annual town meeting. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Gilberto. Any questions for my colleagues? Just a comment, Madam Chair. I just want to Earlier. say that this is a, a culmination of uh, efforts on the part of uh, the administration, uh, DPW, uh, Water Superintendent Mark Clark, uh, uh, a good friend and former colleague, uh, Mr. Masseri. Uh, there were no less than seven different properties that we entered into negotiations with in order to cite this, uh, this facility. 
So it took a considerable amount of effort, time, and energy and effort uh, to come to uh, a situation which didn't require eminent domain taking. Uh, it was a friendly uh, uh, purchase, uh, which is what we tried to avoid at all costs. And uh, again, just to reiterate, seven different properties, all in lengthy discussions with each one of these property owners. Uh, some properties we thought were going to go through, fell through. And, uh, and again, Mr. Dimitri has been a pleasure to work with. And, uh, and again, the, the sighting of it is, is almost perfect as far as uh, uh, meeting our needs. So it's uh, wonderful that it's coming to a closure and we can move forward with uh, another step in uh, getting all our water from uh, Andover and treating it in you know, an appropriate manner. So again, I applaud everybody's effort, but particularly um, Superintendent, uh, Water Superintendent Mark Clark, um, Patrick Bauer, my previous uh, Superintendent of Public Works, and Town Administrator, and again, uh, Mr. Masseri and uh, everybody else that was involved, town engineer, whole host of people, and our consultants. So I uh, thank them all, and I'm glad we're at this point. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. And this was the one that was recommended to us as the best uh, possible location to place this facility as well. So that did have a lot to do with informing our decision on moving forward with this parcel. Um, so this is something that we have addressed and spoken about. It just was a matter of time getting this um, paperwork finalized. And we've had a little bit of an issue to deal with, which is a pandemic and other mm -hmm. things happening in the meantime that have, you know, interfered or disrupted with that. So mm -hmm. thank you for all the efforts involved too, because you were serving, you are serving the town on that team as a, the board's liaison and I know this is a lot of this is a lot of hours and a lot of manpower going towards this so um, we certainly appreciate Mr. Dimitri for his willingness to engage in uh, this and like you said push it push this forward it's another step it's another step forward in terms of effectuating all of the provisions under that uh, intermunicipal agreement with Andover so any other Mr. Gilberto just to be clear for, for the record, this is a, uh, in a an order of taking. It's a friendly acquisition, as Mr. O'Leary indicated, um, with 303 Main Street LLC. That's the owner of the property, not the owner of the restaurant that operates in the property, uh, Dos Lobos, uh, Mr. Dimitri being the principal of 303 Main Street LLC. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Um, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, do I have a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes. Madam Chair, I move to adopt the order of taking in the form presented to acquire an easement for water system purposes at the property located at 303 Main Street and to authorize the chair to execute the order on behalf of the board. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Next order of business is um, town administrator's report. Madam Chair, sure, thank you. Um, I will just note that uh, as was mentioned a couple of times during the meeting, um, we are advised that the governor and the leadership of the House and Senate have agreed to maintain fiscal year 2020 local aid numbers, namely chapter 70 and unrestricted general government aid to maintain them level with um, in FY 2021, despite the uncertainty in the state budget. Um, for us, that means a potential swing in our favor um, to the tune of uh, just around $900,000 potentially. Something that the financial planning team will discuss and, and make uh, recommendations to the, the select board and ultimately to town meeting um, in the coming weeks. Um, you know, certainly we have you know, options available to us, which could range from the restoration of services that needed to be reduced, uh, cut, uh, or even eliminated, but also the potential to uh, plan for what may be an even more challenging year in fiscal year 2022 as well. So that's something that, uh, that we'll discuss with the financial planning team and come back with recommendations for in the uh, late summer and early fall in, in advance of that October town meeting. But I want to thank Representative Jones, who has been in contact 
uh, with us regularly with regard to all things going on at the state level. I know some of the board members have been in regular contact with him as well. Um, and Senator Tarr, who has continued to advocate on behalf of the town, you know, both at the, the statewide level, but also for North Reading specific issues. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Questions? Anyone have any questions? Mr. I have a question. Um, Mr. Gilberto, the, the 900,000 that now we will get, right, that so were, to clarify, so we weren't, when we did the budgets, remember when people, you know, we took into account a 10% a reduction, whatever the number was, I can't remember. This was, we assumed this money wasn't coming? Correct. Okay. And now, um, would it be something, and I, I know, I mean, Ms. Smitty Pelley and, and uh, Mr. Gonzalez is the financial planning team, but before we would decide on any any of the things that had to be cut or not appropriate, will things be taken into account as such as, um, I know that I asked a question of the finance director a couple of weeks back that uh, property tax collection for last quarter was 300,000 light, you know, so will, is that, is that the kind of things that would first be, you know, we would have to offset? Like meaning a loss of revenue or, or was that already figured in as well that we were gonna have that kind of a gap? So we, we would look at the performance of all of our revenue and expenditure areas and make a recommendation. So, you know, I don't wanna, you know, mislead anybody that, you know, is, you know, almost a million dollars sitting on the table ready to be spent. But we're gonna, like the state will, we'll have the benefit of additional months worth of trend to look at and make those determinations. And um, as is the case at their regular meetings, the financial planning team will look at those things and consider them, Mr. Studo. Okay. Thank you. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I think, you know, I, we went through a pretty painstaking process over the last several months, you know, the financial planning team, the board, the administration, school administration, we made some difficult decisions and we were able to make them without, without layoffs, which uh, not a lot of communities can say. And I think if we, uh, and everybody's of the same mindset that the upcoming fiscal year, not the one we're in right now, but the following one could be even worse. Yeah. So I think it's important um, and I'm sure the chair and vice chair will bring back and, and talk to the administrator and the finance director about this. But uh, you know, in short, to me, let's stay, let's stay the course and, and, and keep this money in the bank because I think it's, it, and all indications are, it's not gonna be very good going forward. So it's, uh, <clears throat> if we can, you know, let's hold the money back, hold it available for the next fiscal year, unless something else catastrophic comes upon us. But I think we, we, we set a pretty good course. I think the administration on the school side and on this side, uh, general government side has done a very good job of preparing in the upcoming fiscal year. So I think we need to just hold on to it and be conservative. I like that. Yeah, and I'd be, I'd be in agreement. I, I think one of the things that we know is our revenue, revenue, uh, decreased and may continue to decrease, but our expenses always increase. So we're, we, we already are at a gap in terms of that. And we were able to balance the budget, like Mr. O'Leary said, with the working with the school department and working with our, you know, other town departments to say the things that they really needed that they've requested and some of the departments have requested two, three, three years in a row, we're not able to fund it right now. I think we need to, we need to really be tight fisted with the funding because of the, the long-term impact, like Mr. O'Leary said, but there's a whole team, there's a financial planning team and there's a finance committee and there's a lot of different people that have been involved with tracking the stabilization funds and the stabilization of the town's fiscal fiscal uh, stability of the town for a long time. So those are all people that would have would have to have input. Um, and certainly we'd want to see see to it to see the school had some some objectives that it it had on what it presented for a budget and it had to it had to revamp what it was trying to do with its budget. Um, and that's that's another thing we did and they did so. Um, 
but I, I'd be in agreement with that, too, with what Mr. O'Leary and uh, Mrs. Gonzalez have said. Um, hang on to it. We don't know what the future holds. And we know even with this plan to for the kids to go back to school, we just don't know what what that's going to involve or, you know, what, there's so many unknowns right now with this pandemic. So um, any other input questions or comments for Mr. Gilberto's for Mr. his report? Because now we're on to board member reports if no one has anything else. Board yes. member, I mean, um, excuse oh. me, all the new business. And Mr. Gilberto, are we going to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, you know, that, that I've been in contact with the town clerk and I think as everybody knows, mail-in um, ballots are an option available for the state preliminary election coming up in September. And um, we've seen a very uh, heavy volume of requests coming in. So the town clerk uh, will be uh, adding additional election worker staff um, assisting her office um, in the coming weeks um, after consulting with me. And she does have the appropriation of funding available to support that based on the uh, reduced costs that we've seen in some other areas for elections. Um, but it has been very busy um, with uh, requests coming in and uh, us responding to those requests in the, in the past weeks since those cards were mailed in. And um, the clerk, to her credit, has kind of quickly identified that there was a need for some adjustment and she has um, requested and I've approved that. Um, I believe that that concludes my report at this point. Um, and um, thank you. Mr. Gilberto, did you want to give a COVID-19 update or did you want uh, to just pass that over for this meeting? I, think I know you've been regularly updating us and posting online. So I, I do continue to post the updates online. Um, I, I'm a bit overdue for our last um, update, which I had hoped we would get out on Thursday. But the previous update, we were at a total of 203 cases here in North Reading. Um, so it kind of steadily was increasing a, you know, a couple of cases a week. Um, I think folks may be aware that um, the, our public health nurse, um, she will be uh, stepping down from the position um, and we're going through a transition. We've got a couple of uh, options that we're looking at for um, um, temporary services and we have an ad on the street for a, a longer term substitute. Uh, but make no mistake, as you can imagine, um, th these positions are in high demand. Um, we have moved to increase the compensation a bit and we are looking at, it, at all options on the table including the potential um, um, combining of resources with the school department to assist where they may need, may have needs in their department. So there'll be more to come on that um, at our meeting, um, our second meeting in August. Okay. Were you noticing, I have just have a quick question on that. And I don't even know if you're tracking the data like this, but when the uh, phase three went into effect and the more openings occurred or, you know, the restrictions were lifted somewhat, were you noticing um, any kind of an increase in the number of cases? So we, we saw a, you know, the, the rate of increase really decreased over you know the period of time when we got to early June and into early July. Um, what, what I think was more noticeable from the data that I've seen as of the last report was that we did have um, about a dozen or so probable cases that may never become confirmed cases. And we weren't seeing that. And we saw that in the very, very beginning, the first week or two. And then that sort of went away and now that's come back a bit. So I don't know if, you know, if that's something that will resolve itself or something that will fold into the larger case volume. Um, but it, it is something that the Board of Health obviously is, um, you know, is monitoring um, very closely. And, and I know, you know, we're all kind of waiting with bated breath every day when the statewide numbers come out. I think, I think nearly every resident of the state probably is um, looking at that. And you can see that the numbers have, have you know, ticked up a bit statewide. Um, but when I get my next report, I'll, I'll have a better idea of how much that's washing through, um, you know, here to North Reading um, over the past three weeks. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? And, and Madam Chair, I should say there was a Board of Health meeting tonight. I didn't have the benefit of being on the meeting, so this may have been discussed and I just don't have the information in front of me. You're kidding me. Why didn't you attend that meeting? 
I've seen you do two meetings at once. <laughs> and you saw how poorly I did it, Mrs. Gonzalez, right? <laughs> if only you could figure out how to buy locate. <laughs> All right. So now we're on to old and new business, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, j just a couple of points. One in relation to the uh, again mail-in ballot. Uh, again, remind people take advantage of it if you if it makes you feel safer and um, again it makes it pretty easy. My, my only question, and I'm sorry, the clerk uh, signed off before I had the question, and maybe Mr. Gilberti has, has the answer. You know, I've had some inquiries by people wanting to know. You know, do we have to mail these applications back in? And do we have to mail the ballots back in or will there be um, dispensers, uh, boxes available at town hall to drop off the applications or drop off the ballots? So we are working on procuring a, a separate um, box, if you will, similar to what the treasurer's office has for the delivery only of ballots uh, with a sample ballot probably being pasted to it to designate that. So there'll be more to come on that in the coming week or so. Um, but we are looking to procure a separate box to drop off those uh, those ballots. So will those be available? Will that be available inside town hall or outside town hall? We, we expect it'll be in the outdoor area, so people can access it 24 hours a day. Um, but okay. we we'll put it in an area where it's um, viewed under camera. That's okay. my understanding. And I've had some I've had some questions in relation to the application itself. Whether those could be dropped off, or do they have to be mailed in? Um, Part of the rationale too was, you know, I heard on the news that they're saying, you know, get your application, actually get your application in and get your ballots mailed by August 24th for the September 1st primary, you know, just to ensure that it gets there in time. <clears throat> so some people had been asking as to whether or not, you know, from a timing standpoint, if they didn't get it in or their child who was awake, you know, going to apply, um, is there a more timely way rather than relying on the mail? to drop it off, you know, at town hall, the application itself. So if you don't, if you don't have the answer, that's fine. But if we could get the answer sooner and get it into the newspaper for this week, maybe if Amari is still listening, you know, just to inform people as to how the process is going to work as to whether or not, you know, people can actually drop the application off at town hall and where and when Sure, that would be helpful. I'll speak with the town clerk because I don't want to misstate her intentions, but I know she is tending to this issue. We did discuss, the, the addition of a box in the front of the building, but I, I don't want to misstate its purpose. So I'll right. ask her to put that out. <laughs> okay. And then the only other thing is just, you know, asking the general public, you know, to be vigilant, uh, vigilant uh, you know, wear a mask. Um, what I've observed most recently is that a lot of our uh, youth and young adults are not necessarily participating uh, to the degree that they should be in relation to uh, not just social distancing, but wearing a mask. So, you know, so if we could just inform our children and our youth that, uh, you know, it's important, you know, not just because, you know, they may be invincible, but they could be carriers and could be, you know, infecting, uh, you know, their, their grandparents or someone else or someone else who may be a little bit more vulnerable. And uh, just be vigilant and wear the mask as much of a nuisance as it is. And uh, as Dr. Brooks said, you know, it could actually be a fashion statement, you know, so find a good one. I have some nice little dogs on it. So just be vigilant, wear the mask and stay safe. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner. Uh, nothing to add from my report from before, thank you. Mr. Studo. I'll just actually piggyback on something Mr. O'Leary said and um, Mr. Walner, it was funny, you mentioned uh, last week about how they match the signature and a client of mine brought up a good point that uh, if you get anyone asking, you know, how to do it, you know how people have multiple signatures. I just like to inform that I have multiple signatures. You want to match the one on your license because a way to avoid fraud, if I sign it fully Vincenzo Studo, which I never do at anything at the registry, they're going to, it's not going to match the signature. So just something to point out that a client told me today that a friend of his that used to work at the register made a point that, you know, not everybody has the same signature all the time. And if it's very different, like if you sign full name sometimes and sometimes just like uh, first initial last name, that that will that will trigger something. And if they err on the side of caution, they will not count your vote. So I don't know how much whatever, but I'm just sharing it. Good to know. Thank you, Mr. Studo. Mrs. Gonzalez. 
Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, make a comment about a letter that was sent to all the board members from the um, North Reading Republican Town Committee Scholarship Committee. Um, they are going to be awarding their scholarship this Thursday, August 6th at 7 p.m. at the Town Common. Um, they do this every year and I've attended before and I will be attending again. Um, they ask what the American flag means to you and they award the scholarship um, every year. And this year is Lauren Ann Sullivan. Um, and in the letter, it, it, I mean, it notes how much, what a great leader she's been, um, National Honor Society, student council member, captain of the basketball and lacrosse teams, 100 hours of community service in her junior year, president's volunteer service award, it goes on and on. Um, so um, I will be attending. I know that uh, Representative Jones and Senator Tarr is usually there. Um, she gets to read her essay out loud to everyone and the parents are usually there and it's just a nice little ceremony so i just wanted to bring it to everyone's attention in case they missed the letter and if they would like to attend thank you mrs gonzalez um i looked up the question on that early voting because i remember it becoming it came up as an issue it's online at the at the um secretary of the commonwealth website it says applications must reach your local election office by August 26th for the state primary. Applications must reach your local election office by October 28th for the state election. And uh, clerk staff did mention this to us too at the last meeting. State primary ballots need to be back at your local election office by 8 p.m. on September 1st. But if, if it's a voter by mail, obviously, when you get it, vote and put it in the mail so it reaches them long before 8 p.m., it's kind of defeats the purpose of voting by mail if you have to go and drop it off in person. So, but um, that information is not readily accessible on our town website. And I think it should be a banner or um, just like the COVID-19 alerts are there, that should be a banner because these, these are kind of important dates and differences um, between what people normally know and do on, and, and what's being done to accommodate COVID-19 issues, elections during COVID-19. So I would say that it should be readily accessible somewhere on the uh, website. And I know that was one of the positions that we we uh, had to forego in this budget. So to to give to give Mr. Gilberto credit because he's basically a jack of all trades and also is the one responsible for posting everything to our website too. He's our he's our website manager in addition to all the other hats he wears for the town. So he has a lot of responsibility on his shoulder. So it's not meant as a criticism. It's just meant that when you get to it, it might be helpful to throw something up there as a banner or a quick access type of thing, the find it fast function. Thank you. And with that, um, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion, motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All of you. All right. I have a motion to adjourn by Mrs. Gonzalez, a second by Mr. Studo. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manuel Pelli is aye. All right. Thanks. Thank you, folks. We'll see you Saturday Good morning, everyone. bright and early. <laughs> <laughs>